Right, I'd like to give a testimony because um, I've been kept awake uh, since uh, uh, the time. Oh, it's five in the morning. I haven't slept yet. I was busy doing something up late. I got as soon as I got into bed, this vibration starts under my under my bed somehow. It comes up through the floor, and there's a uh, Something attached to it in the signal, which is demonic or spirit, uh, or familiar spirits, or and I'm trying to rack my brains where, because you see darkly, where's it coming from? Who, whose hands is it? And I could just run off a list of people I could suspect that I've hit the hornet's nest with a stick, so it could be anybody. Um, so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna redeem the time because I've had uh, on my mind for a long time to give my testimony on Mormonism and uh, and how not not Mormonism particularly, but what I've observed, what I dissolved, what I absorbed, having the Holy Spirit before I joined Mormonism and the the powerful hold, the spiritual grip it has on uh, young babes who perhaps don't know the haven't haven't really grown in the word, and that's that's one one thing I really want to expand upon because the Lord knows people's hearts. We don't. We can't say that this person's saved, that person's saved. Um, we can if it's obvious. I think. But I think when it when it's down to um, babies, I don't I don't think you can really tell. And I've I know there's many testimonies of people being caught in uh, a cult or Catholic church or you know um, any of these apostate churches. And uh, growing up, you know, thankfully, thank the Lord, I, I grew up in the wilderness. I didn't have any religious background apart from the traditions of the Church of England, which my brother and I both bucked against because we just saw it as nonsense, and it was nonsense. Um, wasn't Christianity, um, and I think you sent. I think you just naturally sent that. Perhaps the Holy Spirit tells you that even though you're, you're not born of the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit it, it is, a, uh, is a light, it's always on, it convicts in us and I'm sure it um, teaches people right and wrong, people can discern, this, the Holy Spirit can teach people before they come unto faith and, and become born again. So I think people should uh, be a bit more cautious and and because I, I I didn't have that uh, religious upbringing, and I'm not knocking anyone who has. I mean, the body of Christ is so diverse, and you, I think you've got to be grateful for every single, every single life. You know, because uh, who are we really to judge? The Lord, the Lord judge. The Lord's the judge. So we we judge ourselves. And then we learn and we see things. And what I observed in uh, people in um, who've grown up perhaps in Christianity, that none of it is really sound. Really, I I, I think there's a time where it, it, the whole the whole Christian body was apostate. There's probably a scattering of people who were truly faithful to the word. And I think a lot of people growing up in Christianity have become bad proselytes. They've picked up the bad habits. It's like being, if you're taught to drive by your, one of your parents or something, you pick all their habits up. But if you go to a driving instructor, they're more disciplined and teach you what's required. And, uh, and then you pick up your own bad habits, I suppose. But if you talk taught by somebody with bad habits, you pick up those bad habits. And that's what I found listening to elders or people who 
who uh, are bold in their in their faith and you think oh that person must know what they're talking about but when you look at it you know if, over all my experience and looking on it I've, and, and I've, got, I've grown in my relationship with the Lord and trusting in his word and then seeing that the only real driving instructor is Christ, the only good driving instructor is Paul and those who follow after him and, and, and even you know we all have we all have our faults in this day and age I mean we're a long way from the cross and there's a lot of um, you consider all the apostasy and all the, how that affects the body and how hard it is to grow through that I mean but thankfully the, we do with the Lord there guides our footsteps onto those uh, still waters and those uh, on the straight and narrow path in the way and, and I noticed in it more so in America um, where I grew up it's a military place a military t it's home of the British Army home of the um, not the Royal Air Force but the very centred around the Air Force and the uh, aircraft establishment is local and I think that's where perhaps maybe that's where this underground thing is because it's only a stone's throw away the perimeter uh, and that's all the MOD land but I, I really don't know it could be um, could be harp tuning into the uh, magnetic field around the earth so that could be utilised and our house could be underneath it and looking Looking at uh, my life, I can see that people try and steer your circumstances to get you what relationships they want you into, what um, where you where they want to live, and the devil's behind all that, leading these people. And I've been on the end of a craft, you know, um, MK Ultra type craft, uh, trauma based conditioning. So I've seen these hands in my life trying to handle me, and that and that leads me into Mormonism. But I just wanted to give an overview of uh, bad habits in Christians and uh, and I pray that the Holy Spirit is uh, will convict anyone who's uh, perhaps correct their footsteps in love you know I'd, I, I in my heart I just want to see everybody come to that as I do myself is to be one at heart you know one, one in faith come to the same understanding that's true rather than all these diverse opinions and uh, differences I don't there should, should there really be any differences so I'm trying to find out you know learn and grow what is what is what and what's true and hold to it so I'm going to be uh, let my yay be yay and nay be nay and uh, just speak my heart and I pray that it be um, an, it would honour the, honor the father as I um, give this testimony in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and I pray the Holy Spirit will will uh, magnify and uh, testify of the truth if I'm speaking truth or not and uh, my observation is when, when all the Billy Graham stuff come over and how how awful it looks I wasn't saved when I saw it but we had these big big mega churches pop up and I went there's isn't there's this old cinema in all the shot that everyone used to go to all the, all the local area because it was a massive big uh, cinema and they used to have the cinema clubs and that that sort of thing on a Saturday so that usually when you're a kid it was a place to head to and it's a really big multi-story building and then when when the cinema closed down uh, one of these uh, charismatic churches took it over I can't remember what I, I wouldn't know what doctrines that they hold to but I knew some later on in life I knew someone who who joined that church and they're all uh, you know tithe bucket goes around and uh, as I, I used to walk past it and, and, and get this horrible feeling and they're trying to invite you in and grab you in at the door, you know. And it's like, oh no, get off, get away. And and you look in there, and it's it, it you know, all the whole 
holding up a hand. I know that's uh, biblical, but um, not not when it's uh, apostate and irreverent. It's not. It's uh, looking at, on these things and the behaviour. It's sort of off-putting. It does put you off religion, which is a good thing. And uh, I met this um, lady, this uh, vulnerable lady, and she didn't have any money. She raised her, her two boys on her own, and so she worked hard. And then she, and any time she needed help, they weren't there to help her, but she was like contributing to this church. And uh, she was telling me that you know she put her money in the bucket, a tithe or whatever. And then one day she she uh, walked past the pastor's houses or the or the people running the church. And they all they all learn in the living off it. They've all got BMWs. They're all, and she was disgusted by that. And then so, so she left. And then she's wandering around, wondering, well, where do, where do I fellowship? And then you go from out of the frying pan into the fire. She joined the Mormon Church, you know, looking for that uh, fellowship. And I just want to consider that, uh, you know, for people, people with ministries to really consider what it's like, what it's like, you know, to be a new believer, coming up in the faith and then, you know, I think really a lot of people's mouths should be stopped. Uh, and I'm guilty of uh, picking up bad habits myself, but um, I, I always want to uh, re-evaluate and, and put things right if I'm wrong, you know, what's the point if you're I don't want to be set in my stiffened, I don't want to stiffen neck, I want to be humble, I want to be correctable, I want to be teachable. And um, so you see these things and you, and, and I think a lot of it comes from the America, the States, and you get a lot of, a lot of bad habits and a lot of, um, and that, come, that comes over to England, I mean, I always used to grow up thinking, you know, we're only a few miles behind America. And I remember in the 70s, it all used to get all the America, everything become Americanized. And Amer America always, to me, seemed like big, you know, larging it up. And I think the Amer American people were, you know, treated like that. They were cultivated like that. You know, all big, big ideas and everything's large. And uh, you know, loud, loud and proud. And then we used to get all the paraphernalia over right, the American art, Americana, and all the American shows and that, which I used to like. <laughs> uh, but really, it was all all bubble gum and trash, really. Uh, so you see all these um, variations in America and the Bible Belt and. And you see the good, and you see the bad, and you see the, you know, the apostasy, and the all all, all the religious bodies. And then you you, you try and uh, find your navigate your way through through your Christian walk. And then you come to the realization that uh, it just brings you closer to the Lord to rely on the Lord more rather than relying on what other people teach you or whatever what other expert or so-called elder or pastors with you you know with an, with with the, with an authority is saying it's true so um i just wanted to make that observation um i want to give my testimony on uh, uh mormonism and uh how that affected me how that uh blessed me in a way and what I absorbed in there, and what I could see in hindsight from the building up to that, how it, how I was like groomed for it. People were aware of me before I was aware of them, and that became evident in my life because of hands and things happening behind the scenes, affecting my far, you know, blocking me from going, disrupting, so I could, people would uh, turn against me. And then it leaves you dependent, and then you, you know, you kind of wanna, they wanna be there to help you, kind of thing. 
Uh, so I want to give a bit about my testimony, how I came to be saved. I heard um, I was quite um, thrown by this in a way. Um, I heard a, a brother who's uh, got a ministry in the States. I love this brother, and you know, he's a soul winner. But he he said something about um, which shocked me really. It surprised me, and he said um, kind of uh, pointing out about praying to Jesus and that you know that you should pray to Jesus. That's what that's what he was suggesting, and and the kind of spirit was that was I I discern with it was like oh you're you're wrong to pray to the Father, and I, and I thought, well, that's not right, you know. And I I don't know, maybe I got the context wrong. Um, and I know Mormons uh, pray pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, but they're, they're apostate, and their Father's not not our heavenly Father. It's not the Lord's Father, or the or when Jesus was um, on the earth and he prayed to the Father. And he'd done nothing by himself but through the Father. He prayed to the Father. He taught us to pray to the Father. He taught us he, 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 his only way to the Father and he intercedes for us. And we're to pray in his name. Oh, I'm going to read some scriptures. Um, John. John. John 14. John 14 and 15, not all of it, um, where shall I start, Philip, I'll start there, Philip saith so unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us, Jesus saith so unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip, he that seen me have seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believe thou, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believe on me, the works that I do, Right, he that believe on me, the works that I do, he should do also, bear that in mind. And greater work than me shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, if you're asking the Father in Jesus' name, that will, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So, if we we pray to the Father in the name of the Lord, and then the Father will and the, and the Son will answer, because the Father, the Lord intercedes for us in the Father and the Holy Spirit. So we don't pray to Jesus or the Holy Spirit, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, that's what the word's saying. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I will do it. So the Father will do it through the Son, because he'll do it, and the Holy Spirit will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father. See, Jesus prayed to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Uh, another comforter other than Jesus being present, he gave, he gave us the Holy Ghost, so we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit indwelling in our, in our lives, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, and even knows him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Um, right, let's so, like, so let's go back to that verse. Uh, that I do, shall you do also. And I will pray the Father. So that if, if we do what Jesus does, He pray to the Father. So we pray to the Father. Okay, right, let's go to 
John 15. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have learned of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and have deigned you, as talking to the disciples, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and without speaking to all of us, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it to you. Give it you. And we cry out the Father, and then I say, I kind of thought, well, I think it's. I think if people were unaware and you pray to Jesus, well, I think Heavenly Father, and you know, if you honour the Son, you honour the Father. If you honour the Father, you honour the Son, because they're one. They're one. One God, the Father, the the Son, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are one in spirit, although they're three separate personages and three separate. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But it's quite clear that we pray to the Father. So to hear a brother say that was um, odd, not to say the least. So it made me wonder, question a lot about, about that uh, about that brother, because I never heard him say that before. And uh, he's quite an authority. He's got his own ministry. And I thought, well, that's a bit strange. So... Um, if that if you if if you're a young brother or sister and you're watching my testimony um, and you're wondering well who do you pray to well it, it, it's in the scriptures you pray to the heavenly Father in the name of Jesus and uh, I think that will I I know that the Father's answered my prayers when I've prayed like that that's how I was saved I prayed to the Father and. Um, I actually, I heard a testimony from a Mormon. I didn't know he was a Mormon. He was a counsellor, and I had to. I um, I, I was uh, really struggling, and I saw a doctor, and they insisted if they, if they were to take me on their books, um, I, I had to go and see this counsellor, and I didn't really want to go because I didn't. I, I don't trust people with uh, my personal life, kind of thing. I I went there to just get some help without you know without any other one interceding other than the doctor which she insisted. So I went along with it, and it was a pitfall. It, to me, it was like um, set a setup, and these people um, were, vol were voluntary, and they were advertising at the surgery, and it was passed on. You know, this leaflet was passed on to me like a photocopy printer it's called open door you know <laughs> and these people were proselyting and and uh but seek covertly they were like mormons so they're covertly proselyting disguised as um counselors they're all trained counselors and this is what they do it's like jesuits they get um they don't have a t-shirt with Jesuit written on it. They they just appear as a psychiatrist or a doctor, or they get the qualification. You know, and they could get they could just be give printed those qualifications, and then they turn up at the job, and you know, it's, it's not hard to wing anything really, and become, um, appear as a professional. But this was a counsellor, and it and, and some of it did help, but some of it was um, a bit. Uh, deceptive and I could tell but I was very vulnerable and I didn't know I was a traumatised dissociate and vul you know vul very vul vulnerable post traumatic stress and I didn't didn't really comprehend why I was disassociated dissociated and that's like being kind of detached from your ability to assert yourself it's that uh, you can be triggered and into that state you're not always in that state but any, any certain things will trigger you and you should kind of go down in yourself and then when if you're if someone is a, a handler and they know that they could trigger you and then they then they can like you know play with you like their little little toy and steer you in these directions and that's what I was experiencing. 
and uh, so um, going to this uh, counsellor after the first session it was just a plain session and it was all me just getting off my chest about my brother dying and that was all set up as well so it's all an ongoing conditioning from my birth my whole life was planned out crudely now that that may have been directly satan but I, these people were organized so it's a combination of the two these people serve satan whether they all know it or whether there's a core that know it and get other people to to um you know serve them and they're, they're raised up to do the same to do their kind of service but they're not quite aware of what's going on the bigger picture and um on the after the first session it was quite um a, a release really to get get certain things off my chest and i felt quite elated and uh you know lightened but there was this kind of uh I don't know, like a full spirit to it and I didn't recognise that at the time and it sort of um, kind of made me elated rather than peaceful not like the Holy Spirit, it's more like a counterfeit spirit and after the first session he said, oh, you know, really sorry to tell you but we've, we've gone bust, we can't afford to continue he said, oh, but if you like, you can come, you know, I shouldn't say this, he said, but you, you could come. It's unethical, he said, but um, if you would like to, you could come back to, back to uh, my own, I can, we can carry on this in, uh, in private. And he said, oh, you know, I shouldn't really do this, but uh, I'll do it for you kind of thing. And being, being dissociated and vulnerable, my brother just died, so I was absolutely shattered and um, kind of at a loss. And I just kind of just nodded along with it. I go, yeah, okay, we'll give it a go. And I turned up at his house and he tried this meditation on me and he said to me, uh, uh, God smiled when I was born, right? And... Uh, I kind of felt really violated by what he he done because he never told me he was going to do that. He said he he wasn't going to say he said he wasn't going to say anything you know uh, out of order, but I felt that was out of order. And and um, in hindsight, he was trying to you know net me into the Mormon Church. And then when, once that finished, that was kind of like. Um, I just sat on the sofa and he, he, he gave some uh, uh, words of affirmation. It wasn't like a deep uh, hyp hypnotic regression. It was just like a positive affirmation that he had, he had made up himself. But and most of it was okay. It was nothing out of the ordinary. But at the end he said, he, he said that, that God smiled when I was born. And... Uh, that God might have smiled when I was born, but um, and he probably did. But I just felt that was a bit beyond the a bit beyond the pale, and I I just felt some I felt very violated by it. I didn't feel any joy from it. And after this, after that session, at the end, I noticed a picture of Jesus on his mantelpiece. He put he put it there on purpose. This big if you've seen the Mormon pictures, like Mormons have paintings of what, what the impression of what Jesus looks like, and he's kind of a, a fair-haired, good-looking kind of painting of a man with a like a, a soft red robe and a white shirt. You know, it's very polished, very polished paint, very good paintings, very lifelike. I said, "Oh, do you believe in Jesus?" He went, oh yeah. I said, oh. And I, I believed in Jesus, but I, 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 something I kept to myself. 
and it's not something I really consciously thought about a lot I just believe I never really give it any thought it was, it was kind of deep down and um, he, he said um, do you want to know how he said do you want to know I can't remember what he said but he said uh, you can you can know Jesus kind of thing and I said uh, he said if you want to he said, I can't tell you what faith I am, what faith he was from, because it, he was ethically uh, bound, he couldn't proselyte. But in his home, see, he put that picture of Jesus, so I bring the question up. Um, and he said, I can't tell you what faith I am, but he said, uh, he said I can tell you how to pray. I said, OK. And then I started to feel the spirit. <laughs> And uh, the Holy Spirit, not not the spirit he was uh, portraying, but the or the spirit that was lingering around. But I, it got my ears up because I I was kind of at a point where I wanted. I, I think I was ready to know, and the Holy Spirit was working alongside all the counterfeit spirits. And um, he said, uh, "I write you a pattern down." And, and the one thing he said was, he said. If you deny the Son, if you deny Heavenly Father's Son, he said, you you deny the Father. And that really struck me and I thought, yeah, well, that makes perfect sense, of course. If um, the Father's Son came to die and you reject him, well, the Father's not going to hear your prayers. And that's what kind of is trying to tell me. He said, to get an answer, you have to pray to the Father. And in the name of his Son. And he wrote that down, he wrote that on a piece of paper. Dear, dear Heavenly Father, pray, uh, pull your heart out in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. But I didn't know he was a Mormon and, and they, they believe in a different father. But the pattern of prayer was right. And then I started to just wanted to get home and I wanted to go and put that to the test. And I know I was kind of ready, and I took myself out in the evening. That's all I. That's all I, that was on my mind. I wanted to know. I wanted to go and pray, and I'd never prayed before. And he told me to pray out loud, and that's something I never heard before. I thought I just had this notion that you pray quietly. I never really considered it, but it just made perfect sense. So I thought, well, I'm going to put 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 this to the test. I'm going to go to seek, the, seek uh, the Lord for my heart because I was desperate, I had no no life and I kind of come to the end, I was hanging on for my life for my parents sake, I didn't want to live and uh, and I took myself out of the house because I didn't want to I didn't want to do that home in the home environment because I was living at my parents and so I took myself somebody, somewhere quiet to the field a field I used to like to go to and just met, you know, just ponder things over and, you know, take some time out, evaluate your life, that sort of thing, and then w walk home. It wasn't very far, but it was quite late at night, and I just just couldn't wait to um, get out after the after my tea and that. And uh, eventually, I thought, right, I'm gonna. Go, go out and do this because I, I, I just felt oppressed at home so it's holding me I think the devil was holding me back so the time I got round to doing it it was quite late in the evening but once I got out of the house I felt really lightened and I just couldn't wait to get there on my knees and I just uh, called out Heavenly Father you know um, I can't remember what I said but it's just along the lines, do you love me? I want to know. I want to know if Jesus is, uh, if if Jesus lived, and you love me. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, Amen. And as soon as I said that, I felt I felt the love of the love of God fill my heart, and felt so much joy and happiness. Like all my burdens, it's just like I was a new life, completely. Everything was washed away, 
and I just I just couldn't wait to tell my mum and dad. Oh, I know, and I, you know, it's like I know, I know God, I know Jesus. He's answered my prayer. And uh, I told my mum and dad, <laughs> when interested, and it's like smack in the face. So I just wanted to carry on telling everybody that, uh, but uh, everyone, you know, everybody. And then you meet, then you lose all your friends. You get door slammed in your face, and then you really learn what what it's like to be a Christian. Praise the Lord, and uh, so that was my beginnings. But then, the, then I come a cropper, and the devil's all over me. I was dis dissociated, and uh, I left everything behind. Um, all, my, all my I burnt all my bridges with drugs, with all my friendships. I told all my friends I was a Christian and it was like, uh, you know, you're like the smelly one in the room, they don't want to know. And then you realise who your friends are and I thought, well, you, you know, you, you don't love me, don't love my God. Love me, love my God, love my Lord. And they didn't, so that was that. Then I cut all ties to that association and that world. But then I was at an end, where do I go, you know? And I looked at religion and just felt sick. And I thought, where do I worship? You know, where do I... And I hadn't really had a prayer life. I, I had that experience with prayer, but I didn't think to pray again. I thought, well, I've prayed once. And, you know, I didn't have any discipline, any experience. And then the devil was over me. I was cornered by the devil. He was too powerful. And he had me pinned in a corner. And I'd stripped all my room out. I, so I basically took all everything I owned, all my CDs. I had about a few thousand pounds from de uh, selling, selling pot, because that's how I made. That's how I, cause I couldn't get a job. That's how I made a living selling pot. And I never spent the money. I just put it in the shoebox and brought myself things I needed. And I, I didn't need to spend any money on pot. So I, that's that was my life, pot. I just wanted to smoke pot to to just for to what you know, just for comfort, just to soothe as a balm. And then and that got me into that world. And then then I saw how iniquitous it was, and I thought, well, I, I want to try and get it myself. And um, I'm not going to be like that. I'll sell it for a profit. You know, I'll make enough money on it, but I won't won't be a rip-off merchant and I, I'll get more people that way to so, so you know, I was trying to be like a, a responsible drug dealer you know not really realizing that there's no such thing and so um, I took all my money you know I didn't give it to the right people I just took it into a, not the nearest charity shop which was an Oxfam if I'd have known any different I'd have taken it to a more independent charity but there you go, I took it to Oxfam and I gave all the money in the shoebox, brand new pair of uh, camel shoes worth a few hundred quid, loads of about three, two, 200 CDs, a bit more, a bit few more than that and all my worldly goods, I just dumped them on, on the counter and walked out and then that was my new, new walk and then my... <laughs> My room was empty, there's nothing in it, and I sat in the corner and I did I did read my scriptures and uh trying to I didn't really know where to start in the Bible, so I was kind of lost at a loss. And I was read probably reading in the wrong areas and tripping myself up with things and getting the devil was all over me with it. So I never really got to the the vital parts, you know, like uh John, first John and uh but the Holy Spirit taught me the plan of salvation. He taught me uh, many wonderful things. So, you know, the Lord really anointed me with a testimony to make up the difference where I was lacking. But uh, the devil was tripping, you know, tearing it apart, tripping me up. You know, and getting me to a position where I thought, uh, you know, I'd fallen from grace and I slipped back into. I picked up cigarettes again, and uh, the devil was all over me with that. Oh now, now look at you, now, you know, the Lord's blessed you, and now look how you repay him. 
and then I started getting all these um, voices and I, I and I thought I just the Lord was sustaining my conscience and just holding me so it wasn't really getting a hold on me but inside I was being tossed around really badly but the Lord was just steadying me you know like on the end of a stick and uh, I, I thought eventually the uh, I thought I was going to hell, I thought I'd blame it, I thought I'd blame my salvation. And then I just spiralled out of control and it took me two years really. And then after that trial, the Lord just picked me back up and put me, without even asking, you know, without even praying, he just picked me back up. And then the Holy Spirit, uh, and I thought, oh, where do I go and meet fellowship? And I thought, oh, I'll go and see that... Uh, the guy gave me that prayer because I didn't know he was a Mormon at this time and the Holy Spirit said don't and I didn't listen I thought what, you know, I was so confused with all the devil all over me I didn't really recognise the Holy Spirit although I knew it you know, looking back in hindsight it was I knew it was the Holy Spirit but I, I didn't have any grounding I didn't have any establishment in the Word so I went, went to see him and uh, you know, against the Lord's will, against the, uh, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he, he was, it was about two years later, <laughs> it was two years after I'd last seen him, he said, oh, I didn't think I'd ever see you again. And uh, he said, uh, I, I said, um, I told him what I, my press testimony and I was saved. He didn't really say anything. He was like, oh. And I'd been praying to find a church, you see, and um, to fellowship, to meet Chris, other Christians. And I thought, oh, I'll go and see that bloke, you know, see what church he goes to. And I did have, I did pray, and I, 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 in hindsight, I said a real um, prayer contrary to what all, I'd already been told. I'd already had the answer, so the Lord didn't really listen to my prayer. And because uh, I'd already been told not to go go to that bloke because the Lord knew what was behind it, I did and I couldn't see for it wood through the trees. So um, I visited this guy, turned up at his house and his, his wife answered and said, oh, he's at work. And uh, it was almost like the devil would set it up. And I heard, um, I went to his, uh, on the, on, he were he he wasn't very far from his house and I went down to his workplace, he was working in an office. I can't remember what he was doing. He was um taking on contracts and placing people in employment, I think, kind of managing uh working for somebody to, to place people, find recruits or something like that. And he was in an office decorating in the office and I turned up and he is surprised to see me. And I said, "Oh, what, what, what church? You know, what, what, sort of, what, what do you believe in?" Kind of thing. And he was telling me. Then he started telling me about uh, the, these golden plates and uh, uh, this um, book, uh, this another testament of Jesus Christ. And it sort of like appealed to my flesh, I think, rather than the Holy Spirit. I said, "Oh, wow, gold." You know, another testament of Jesus, you know, this mystery. Oh, what is it? I'd like to know, kind of thing. And then, coincidentally, I had the radio on, and, I, and there was a Mormon guest on the radio. And that's the first time I really heard about Mormons, you see. I didn't know anything about Mormons. And this guy come on, and he gave a testimony about um, the Celestial Kingdom and all, these, all this stuff. I can't remember exactly. Uh, and again, it's kind of appealing to my flesh, and I become I, I began to become more interested in that. And then he said, "Oh, you know, gold plates." He said, "Come back for tea. I've got something for you." He said, and I thought, "Oh, okay, I can't wait." You know, what what is it? What is it? Kind of thing. Hungry. What is it? What is it? <laughs> Went back to tea, and his wife, him and his wife were. His wife was lovely and uh, 
he 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 was he was a handler. I'm pretty sure of it. He he knew what he was doing, and he and it and I realised later on he was a high priest in the Mormon Church. Anyway, he gave me this book of Mormon, and uh, I thought, oh, go and give it a read. And I read it cover to cover. Got to the last bit. If this isn't true, you know, the like, bit of Moroni it says at the back. Um, and a lot of it, what you know, there's, the Holy Spirit was um, edifying me with certain things in it, but the the things that were rubbish was just kind of like tinkling cymbals and you know, sound in the brass. It, but there are certain things that the Holy Spirit would say that they're true because they were. There's a, a, a there's a few threads of truth in the Book of Mormon, and that's how they use. You know, that's what they use, and they want to catch a born again believers because it's they want to suck your blood, they want to use your light, they want to put you in a position where you're a missionary or something or in a calling where you're they're using your light up, they're putting your light in their lamp holder kind of thing and that's what I was finding, that's what I realised as time went on and uh, he gave me this book of Mormon and I read it, read it cover to cover and and he said about um, yeah I got to the end of it and also he gave me the missionary's address which coincidentally just a few doors down from my 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 house literally down the end uh, about hundred feet and uh, turn right turn left another hundred feet and then they were living right on that you know just round the corner. And I went round every day while I was reading this book of Mormon because it took me a, about a day or two. So I'd go round to the missionaries but they weren't in. And then I'd finish the book and I went round to the missionaries, they still weren't in. And at, at the end it said, um, pray to see if these things are not true. And I thought, well that's a bit odd, if they're not true. I thought that's kind of a hook, I kind of, the Holy Spirit told me that's a hook. But I prayed to know, um, I, wanted, I wanted to just fellowship in the church, so I prayed that he would, um, I, I said, Heavenly Father, I don't want to be deceived. I really don't want to be deceived. Would you get him to ring me and invite me to church if it's, you know, if it's right for me? And that's what I prayed. And of course, Heavenly Father had already told me not to go around there, so uh, the Lord let me be deceived. <laughs> And he rang, and I thought, oh, that's an answer to my prayer. But, I, you know, looking in hindsight, you know, that's the devil on the end of that. And I thought, oh, I'll go to church. And I didn't, so I didn't, hadn't caught up with the missionaries. They'd never been round to my house. I've never, ever had any more missionaries round knocking on the door. I had Jehovah's Witness, one Jehovah's Witness lady. But I used to give her a hard time and wind her up. I just used to let her in to torment her kind of thing. Just a mocker, not mocker, but uh, you know, go nah, no thanks. Let her spend an hour or two talk, trying to convince me, and I go nah, no thanks, because I was bored. And um, but she was a lovely lady, and uh, I, I got I got lift to church, which was um, the next town, and oh. It, the impression I, I got it was like everyone were, were all twisted and um, proud, all the kids were proud, looking at me like I'd, you know, something the cat dragged in, looking down their noses kind of thing and I felt really, oh this is awful. And uh, you know in hindsight I don't know how on earth I continued but I, I was so disassociated and led along that I, that I ended up uh, Getting the missionaries that day on the, on the um, first first meeting, and I went to the meeting and it was just like alien, and I felt everyone had twisted souls. But I just thought, well, you know, not nobody's perfect, and I thought, oh, I'm looking for the body of Christ kind of thing. That's what my spirit was yearning for, and I thought, well, are these are just are these just imperfect people? 
trying to justify what I was experiencing, justifying it away, and that's what I did. I, you know, my ears were shut, and I'd been, I was being deceived and led into it. And then, then after the meeting, the missionaries had hanging around at the, at the back of the, back of the chapel, and this was a, a built chapel that the members had had, had built, and uh, all the people in in the chapel were. Uh, lifelong members and, and part of the foundation of that, you know, getting that chapel built, getting the planning permission for it. So they're all pretty clicky. And uh, I, I saw the missionaries hanging around at the back, and they were lovely guys, lovely young lads. And they were like thrilled, oh, like, oh, you're, you know, they call me the golden. The, the golden uh, proselyte because I'd come to them sort of thing and they were so chuffed I think and they were so green but just, just so beautiful and then went through the gospel with them Went had a missionary discussions went through the gospel with them and I asked them oh, do you believe in the Father God the Father and that he um, when Jesus was on the earth the Father said this is my beloved son so do you, I said, do you believe in the Trinity? Because the Holy Spirit had already taught me the Trinity, the Father. Because I'd read, I'd been reading the Word of the Bible as well, so I, 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 I picked it up, and I'd been edified by everything I read because I was thirsty and hungry. And what I did read, the, 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 I got the increase. So I knew that um, I knew, I'd read the Gospels. I think I'd read, read John actually started with John just by coincidence and then I got a bit confused with some of the things and that's and in hindsight I know I now I know why because it was um, not all applicable to the, the believer today it was um, applicable to the uh, the Jews um, so I got a, you know do I you know, do I do this? Do I do that? Should I be doing this? I was, I was really confused. But but the main basics that the the father and the son were two, they were separate. I knew that much. The the Bible's pretty clear on that. And the Holy Spirit's a third member of the Godhead. And I read John one that there's three that witness in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And that's what that was my testimony and conviction. And I asked them that. They clarified it. I thought, oh. You, you believe that? Yeah, that's good. So it went on to the next lesson. And I kind, uh, and kind of the, f the odd things, I just like, because um, I was like keen, I kind of ignored it. You know, I just switched off to things I didn't really understand. But all the basics they confirmed, which was that they were lying, you see. So uh, I didn't realise they were lying because I didn't know what they really believe because they don't tell you what they believe until you get in there. And that's their thing. I, you know, getting through the door and then um, let you know they can't. They're probably told, oh, you can't uh, tell people everything we know. You got to break it to them gently, so that you know it's like masonry. You know, elevate you one step at a time, and if you if you're not the right fit, you're not going to go up. But if you uh, fit the fit the slippers, up you go. You know, if you're a crook, up you go. If you're a good person, they can use up you go. If you're obedient, up you go. If you're a crook, up you go. You know, it depends what arm you're on. And uh, so I had all the missionaries uh, uh, telling you about the celestial, celestial kingdom, and they show you in the word. I, I had no, I, I had no idea about that. I didn't know that you'd. Um, I hadn't read Ephesians. I hadn't read, you know, most of the epistles. Um, didn't have anyone to teach me, so I was really out of my depth. I was literally out of my depth. But the Holy Spirit, the Lord's with me, even though I, you know, transgressed, and I was getting a scolding and uh, going into this uh, pitfall and this briar, these brambles. It was like a brown, spiritual brambles that wrap around you and, and uh, get into your life, oppress your life. And I was oppressed, I was getting more and more oppressed by it and I couldn't understand why I wasn't feeling the spirit there. I was feeling it at home, you know, my own private room when I read the scriptures, but I wasn't feeling it. Um, 
because I wasn't confessing my sins or anything, or wasn't seeing I was doing anything wrong, I wasn't really confessing my sins, so I was uh, slipping further and further away to darkness. And then I agreed to, I, I agreed a baptism day, and uh, I was baptised in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, so it all, all was going well. And I felt the Lord bless me for that, even though they weren't, you know, they were holding to some other gospel. I, I did feel that the Holy Spirit, you know, blessed me. But, um, didn't, I, I, you know, it's like blessings and cursings. And uh, I can't, they, the rules are just shame, a change, because usually, what the Mormon Church teaches is that you get the Holy Ghost by the laying on their hand. And my argument was, well, I already had the Holy Ghost. And I was a bit, um, I didn't know anything about the High Priesthood until my, my baptism. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, there's only one High Priest, and that's Jesus, he's my High Priest. And I'd learnt that much from reading the Scriptures, so I thought, um, I kind of dismissed it, you know, I didn't really, and then they sh they kind of um, clarify it in the word. I see the, uh, you know, the um, Paul gave the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. They didn't understand that you receive the Holy Spirit through faith alone and the operation of Jesus and you're brought into the body and you receive the Holy, the Holy Spirit. I've been through that operation and I had it and I knew it. But I hadn't had it, I wasn't so grounded in the word, so I kind of waved that off and and you choose somebody to baptise you. And I chose, I didn't know, well, should I ask the missionaries to do it? Or that guy that gave me the original uh, prayer. So I asked I asked him to do it and he, so they just changed it. Usually you'd get, the day you'd be baptised, you'd get the, straight after you get the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit in their religion. But they changed it so I had to wait a week. So I waited the week and they'd done it in a, in a service. And they do it publicly in, in front of everybody. And he said, <laughs> and then I, I had a query with him. I said, Said he told me he's a high priest. Oh, and that's when I discovered about the high priesthood. And I said, well, Jesus is my high priest. And uh, I thought that's a bit odd. And I went, for, carried on going, just dismissed it, carried on going, sitting on the chair, and he was behind me. He put his hands on my head, and and he he gave a prayer in the power of the priesthood. And I thought this is really weird. And then he pushed his, you know, he sort of like he said, receive the Holy Ghost. He pushed his hand down, and I felt he was mocking me. You know, he knew. It's like he knew what he was doing, and he knew that he wasn't, uh, you know, following a load of nonsense. It was almost like he wasn't a believer. He's just pretending, and he was, he was infiltrated in that system amongst people who did believe it. And and there's a lot of people like that. You discern that. So there's a lot of people hiding behind the uh, public and a lot of the mem members are naive, vulnerable people and they don't see the darker side to it and I discerned that he knew what he'd doing and later on it turned out he he knew exactly what he was doing he used to uh, say things to me when he walked past he was quite a powerful guy, you know, powerful in what the knowledge he had and how to use that, how to handle, how to groom people, how to handle people, how to control people, how to get other people to do things that he'd suggest things and they'd do it for him. And I just felt he was mocking, what a mock, what a mockery. Now whether that was him and Satan and he wasn't aware of it, but I, I, I just said he was, he knew exactly what he was doing. And as time unfolded, I could see that he was his part of part of grooming me into that chair, and it was almost like there's a. I started to realise that all the voices in my head were actually targets. They were like uh, voice to skull, uh, military grade weapons. So there's an organised group netted around me in my life, 
and they're steering me into that direction through the doctors and I went back to that doctor and uh, it I got struck off for no reason I just turned up and I was absolutely the the worst thing in the world the attitude they treated me was like I'd, I'd raped somebody or murdered somebody they really with such contempt, this was the secretaries because I went in to make an appointment and they said you, you're no longer welcome here, get out and I said well why, what, what have I done, I want to see my doctor you know and I just only just got this doctor after being told to kill myself from another doctor and that was all handled and that was uh, all set up and um, I thought what's going on here and then a few years later, from I wasn't going to church, but there was a few members that I'd used to go and visit, an old lady, lovely old lady, and we had a lot in common. She had uh, basically suffered what I suffered with, so I could relate to her, and we'd just sit and read the scriptures. And uh, on a Monday, so a Monday morning, I used to go and visit her, and we'd like just read through the Bible, have a prayer, read through the Bible. It's quite, you know, it's quite a nice fellowship. And uh, I didn't feel any any anything wrong that doing that. I did with I didn't feel any badness fellowshipping with her. And she was just very uh, naive, I think, and innocent to the deception. And I think she really did believe in the Lord and God. I don't think she really held to Mormonism so much, but that that was she just stayed there. But she never said that openly. Uh, she her, her she had a daughter that had left and realised it was a load of crank, and I think she knew, but she, she it's where all her friends were, it's all her social life, so she kept her mouth shut. And she, you know, so I I did used to really we did it was a very spiritual experience. We did feel the uh, fellowship of the Lord together, and I appreciate that. And she's passed away now. Uh, so I get to the doctors and uh, have that experience and then speaking with this lady a few years later she was like you know kind of gossiping telling me what she is in the in the thing and she heard something about me that somebody had rung up been ringing up about me and uh, reporting me kind of thing and and she told she let she let me know that somebody had rung she told me who it was but I I was disassociated dissociated so so when she told me it just was like didn't didn't I heard it but it just didn't register I was kind of you know almost like triggered by it and then you just switch off and I switched off and it was only later that when I reassociated I thought what she, did she just tell me that? She just come out and tell me that that somebody had rung up that doctor surgery, and and controlled the event, and that's what caused them to throw me out. So someone had given a false witness that f she was telling me who it was from the Mormon Church, and I can't remember who she said. I think it was this guy who was a counsellor. So somebody was handling me behind this, and that was like ding, ding, ding. So I didn't progress in the church. I had a, I, I was probably there for a few months, six months, and they were encouraging me to go on a mission. I weren't buying any of it. They're trying to get me to have the priesthood. weren't buying any of it. They wanted to get me through the temple. I weren't buying any of it. And uh, I was kind of there's half of me that's kind of going along with it and believing in it, but this Holy Spirit was like, no, 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 no you know, nourishing me as I read the Bible, because I got my Bible from the Mormon Church, and it's got the Old and New Testament, it's got the authorised King James in it. It's, uh, there's nothing wrong with it, apart from the chapter headings and the, the, uh, the reference notes at the bottom, you've got to be careful with those, and the topical index and the dictionary. That's a bit perverted, but apart from, the scripture's perfect, so, I, I was uh, studying my Bible, I put the Book of Mormon aside and I just read my Bible and I got into the, then I started getting into the, really getting into the, 
the, the epistles, Corinthians, and uh, I think all of it, you know, I'd read it a few, round and round and round and round <laughs> until it stuck. And uh, Revelation was a mystery to me. But I'd, I'd give it a go. And, uh, and so eventually I, I kind of just stopped going after about a year. And I did get the priesthood eventually, the uh, the priesthood, but uh, I kind of uh, com tried to com uh, for comply to it, and I went along with it, got the priesthood, and then and then uh, I, don't know, I changed my mind. I thought, no, this is something not right. And I, I was trying to figure out the lie. I was trying to spot what what it was about the Book of Mormon. I was trying to get to the the bones of it that I knew it was wrong. And, the, and all the false spirits I was discerning, and they took me to a temple open day, trying to get me to encourage me to go to the temple. And in there, I felt, oh, I just, oh, it was awful. It was almost like false angels, demonic, like, but it was like heavenly. And I could like uh, discern all these, like a host of spirits singing in a choir. It wasn't the people singing, I could hear the, uh, the spirit singing in, in the temple and it's kind of electrifying but it wasn't spirit, it wasn't that, it wasn't the sober holy spirit and I had this horrible impression from going in there and sort of like, oh I've got to get out of here and it was up in Preston so it was a long coach journey and on the way back I just, I just couldn't, my, my, my mind was, I was kind of high high off it you know like really spiritually high off it and I had to I spent I spent um, all night walking around the streets pondering about trying to shake off this spirit and I was trying to and I was praying and uh, and I was pondering on things I'd learned and that, that kind of brought me down and uh, I thought I'm never going back there again it was just wrong and I could see it was a full spirit and I tried to figure out well, what things in the Book of Mormon were just didn't add up, there's so many things that didn't add up how uh, the authority, you know, they said the, the authority there's no line of the authority for them to get the priesthood it's just sort of turned up out of the blue that they suddenly had it and I thought well, that that's a bit odd and that don't make sense, you know, and it's just all these, it, it just, uh, it was just like made up stories, I could discern it, but I hadn't had it clarified. And um, eventually, I was reading Ezekiel uh, 34, and the Holy Spirit just uh, brought me to my senses that Jesus was my only advocate. You know, that's what I'd lost sight of, my first love. And the Lord brought me, delivered me out, carried me out by that that whole chapter I read. I was just like listening to the sacrament talks. They have a sacrament meeting, they call it a sacrament. And they bless, bless the bread and the water with a prayer. Give thanks and then it passes round the, round the ward by these little deacons, they pass it around. And I, I just switched, all the talks were like, nah, 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 just empty, hot air. And I thought I'd just read my scriptures. So I read Ezekiel 34, I just opened it up and it's Ezekiel 34. And I sat there quietly and I used to move around sitting. People would sit in the same seats every week and I'd sit in a seat, I'd sit in a different seat every week. And uh, I was at the I sat right at the front this week, that week, and I was reading Ezekiel, and the Lord just just spoke to me, you know, the He's my shepherd and He's rescued me, and He He it was like He'd come and called me out and carried me out on the Spirit, and I never went back after that reading that verse. It just brought me back to my senses that I was the Lord's sheep, and that He confirmed that. And I just left, and that was that. And then I had, uh, I still went to see this lady, 
and I hadn't really I just left I hadn't really consciously thought I just left and and the Holy, Holy Spirit had got me out and I knew I was out but I didn't kind of think about any any further forward than that so I carried on going to see this lady but I wouldn't have gone back to the fellowship so I thought oh, I just you know I just go and see this lady on a this old lady on a Monday and that's all I'm going to do and um, I just ordered all these old now I'd never heard of any of these old prophets of the church false prophets and I'd all um, in in they were giving out all these uh, old manuals that went back years and years and years and years of all the different uh, prophets. Every time there's a prophet, they'd, they'd have a teaching of his teachings on the scriptures and on the Book of Mormon. And I got some of the really old ones. And uh, I brought I brought one to discuss with it, you know, just to read it with this lady, and then we was going to talk about it, kind of thing. And I brought, I can't remember, I think it was John Taylor or something like that, or one of the old prophets, or my, oh, Joseph Fielding Smith maybe, I can't remember. I had a whole whole collection of them and I hadn't even read them. I just picked one and took it round there. And uh, opening it up, it said that, uh, that have their father, now, I, now I'd known about the Mormon father by then, but I just, it just didn't register. It was I was almost like blinkered. I had a wall pulled over my eyes. Although I had the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it had enough power over over me for the, for, for for a while. And this is what broke it really. That the Ezekiel thirty four got me out, and this shattered any anything else to do with it. It was just like that was it. It's gone. The scabs off my eyes. Praise the Lord. And it said in there, oh, I was absolutely disgusted and ashamed. And I and, and I went and repented that night and said, Oh Lord, I'm so sorry. And he, the Lord just washed it away. And I just felt, you know, renewed instantly. And uh, what it said was that the father came down and had sex with Mary. And, and of course, I, that what they teach in the church is a prophet never lies, and it's always uh, always the same. But when you look at it, it's, every prophet had a different, so a new revelation that changed the last revelation, and these people couldn't see it. Well, I hadn't known it because I'd only known, been there a short while, and there was only one prophet on the earth at that time, and that was uh, Gordon B. Hinckley, I think. And uh, so I didn't know any of this stuff about their past and the history and there's no internet at that time this was pre the internet and if there was internet it's very basic and you, you know probably only a few people would have access to it i didn't have a computer and uh so reading this i just that oh, that was it, it went, everything went in the bin book of mormon went on the fire and i was out i was clean and i wrote a letter to get my name off threatened them that if they didn't I'd, be suing them and they officially took my uh, name off the books I still got the letter but uh, there's all these demonic spirits trying to you know guilt me but they just didn't have any hold on me it was just gone it, it just slipped away and that's what I was feeling under this um, this vibration comes up the floor and there's these spirits on it and they're like wrapping them so trying to drag me hold me in bed like but they they got no power, so they they just melt away. But every night it's the same old thing. It's like kind of waits till I'm asleep, and when I start dreaming, I start dreaming that these things are hold, you know, trying to get me, holding me on, and paralysing me. But but I shake it off quite easily. And I'm thinking, well, what? Who's who's firing this underneath my bed? And how's it coming? That's what that's what's kept me up. So I thought, oh, I'm going to get my testimony on the uh, net and how I was netted into the into the church. So that broke uh, the shackles and uh, I was off, I was out and praise the Lord, I, I started to stay in my own home and I'd, I'd study the word and then I started praying to be led to find proper fellow uh, believers. Well, I'm going to have a pause now. I need to go to the loop. Oh, right, I just got a drink.
shrink continuing on and I want it to I've just um, been prompted and reminded about some things about the some things come back to my memory and that's the trouble I have a bad memory and uh, I've got frontal lobe damage and I was born with that executive dysfunction plus I was traumatised disassociate and I had a, a, car, a set up car crash after I contended against the Mormon church I had this car accident and I never got any treatment and the police falsified the report the ambulance falsified the report would you believe it it was all staged and um, my doctors led me around the houses to uh, get a proper um, referral to a uh, a hospital specialist I wanted a CAT scan but every time I applied for one they're like they won't give me one so uh, that's why I'm limited to travel uh, limit I really struggle to concentrate it's only by the grace of the Lord that I've been able to survive but what come back to my memory we got and I think that's why I'm having these experiences because they help me remember things that I wouldn't normally think about because it wouldn't, I'd, I'm just blank otherwise. The Lord has to help me. And it's only by living the gospel that I can get by, you know, I've got something to live for, I've got something to, um, apart from my, you know, material life uh, with my labours and responsibilities and uh, the day to day stuff. But um, that's a struggle. But having things to do, help, it helps me keep on track. But uh, what came to my mind was, uh, I remember in the church, I before I um, read that uh, verse, Ezekiel 34, it wasn't long before that, I was getting all these horrible impressions about sexual paedophiles and... Uh, it kept troubling my spirit and, I, and the only one I had to talk to was a friend in the church a close friend of mine in the church almost like a father figure and, and um, I would tell him about them and uh, he was having um, he told me about uh, sleep paralysis No, I'd never heard of sleep paralysis and I think it's a result of fellowshipping with in that ward. And there is a lot of paedophilia that goes on in the church. I'm pretty sure it is. That's the impression I've got. Because we live by faith, we're to try the spirit. So I'm not going to say that's left the Lord. This is definite. This is just not the impression I had. Uh, it might be a lying spirit. But um, I've had depression so many times. And... and researching uh, there's a lot of people's personal witnesses because I was completely blank didn't have the internet but then discovering uh, other MK Ultra survivors and satanic ritual abuse families uh, nesting in the church but you know disguised in the church and I think that's what's at the core of uh, Mormonism it's a paedophile ring and then, the, and then there's a testimony of underground tunnels child trafficking from Canada to England to America to all over the world uh, and I think um, Mormonism is a big component of that and um, I think a lot of the uh, a few of the um, general authorities were those blood drinkers because you could they had the symptoms in their eyes of uh, uh, of um, being addicted to the uh, adrenal glands of uh, sacrifice victims and it can cost a lot uh, a vial of that that drug that uh, adrenaline from the adrenal gland which is extracted when somebody's really terrified and they release all this adrenaline into this gland into uh, and then they uh, extract that somehow in the blood I think uh, and harvest it and then it's a, an addictive drug it's uh, apparently it's a uh, 
an incredible um, high and uh, there's a lot of diplomats being caught with it in in airports you know but because they've got diplomatic immunity they don't have to declare, declare anything but I think people have left left um, luggage on the on the plane and then this stuff's been discovered so I think that's the I was getting these horrible impressions about you know ritual sexual abuse and I'd always wondered in in the church if uh, parents tell their children, oh, you know, there's this higher higher level, there's this higher understanding. So if you're a Mormon and listen to this, and and, and this is uh, this is actually true, and, you, and you're a, a young girl, a young boy, and you've been told, oh, you know, there's this higher level of knowledge that you know the people lower down on the privy to. And I just got the impression there's a lot of incest. But I could be wrong, but uh, I'm just going to trust in in the promptings and the impressions. And I think a lot of um, parents would, will say to their daughters or something, you know, that's a, uh, I've not heard any testimony of this. I've heard of incest, but not not how it's uh, what these families are, are taught to believe. But it's e it's easy to uh, teach that sort of lie oh you know it's a higher spiritual gnosis and that um, it's just for the father to have sex with his daughters or something like that or I don't know it's, I, just, I just was getting these really sick impressions in, in the church and um, my mate was suffering from uh, sleep paralysis and I'm not saying he is involved, I don't think, I believe he is involved, but I believe it's because you fellowship in this kind of you're yoked to, and then you take on all, all of it really, you take all the sins of it and that's what you feel when you go in there, your spirit is vexed, the spirit, Holy Spirit is vexed within you, but you don't know why or what it is, so until you remove yourself, those um, impressions would, would remain otherwise but when once you leave and you repent and you, you you've come back to your your senses and you've been drawn back to your to the Lord to your first love and then you get your, you get the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in in abundance and we and you just feel uh, rewashed again you've renewed in your mind in your heart and then as things unfolded, I, I realised that, um, you know, I, I've been in part of that myself. And I'll give some uh, conjecture on, on this and hypothesis. And uh, I think that... Um, that sort of activity goes on and I believe it's uh, re it's under the control of uh, right, the Roman Catholic Church and I think the two are linked very strongly although they appear to the public that they're different but um, being a traumatised victim and seeing the net around me and how people are steering my life and uh, putting voices in your head and putting voices and, 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 and also doing that to other people around you so they can like suggest things and turn that person against you because they've, you know, they believe it's they've been led by thoughts to come to that conclusion it's how Satan hold, uh, controls people um, I kind of lost my train of thought. I should have prayed, really. Yeah, I wanted to mention the um, the uh, paedophile abuse and the testimonies of uh, other people that I heard in the church, and my friend getting a sleep paralysis, and and then I remembered, ah, that's the sort of um, what was happening to me, and I, then I. I was in the kitchen making a drink and I thought, oh, the Holy Spirit's just impressed upon me and brought that to my remembrance. And 
I believe it, it it's so I can recall these events and share them otherwise I would have just passed on and carried on going without looking back so I think there's a lot of that goes on so if you are a Mormon member in the church and you know you've been told that you're special and it's a part of the godhood, you know, development into godhood. Well, run for the door because it's not, it's wicked, it's perverse, it's demonic. Because the Mormon church is full of demonic, familiar spirits, and it's just rife with them. And uh, that, that sort of behaviour won't do you any good whatsoever. And uh, so. There's a lot to uh, cover. Anyway, I left Mormonism and I feel that there's um, my friend that I opened up to, he's, he's a very kind, soft man and uh, he's got a lot of friends in the church and I, I, I got the impression that uh, he knows something or knows that somebody who's part of it and uh, he's sort of like in a rock and a hard place because I've not seen him so I don't know if he's not well but he, he said he'd be round to see me one day and I don't hear from him so he's done that a few times so I think he just doesn't want to come round and I wonder if that's the reason that someone's confided in something he's still party to it and uh, he's compromised himself or been compromised by emotional attachment or loyalty to a friend or so uh, I that that might be way off the mark but um, that's the impression I get uh, but I was definitely handled into that group by um, a covert team that's followed me all my life um, my grandfather and, and I get the impressions that I'm a seed of Israel on my dad's side and possibly half on my mum's side but I know uh, that my mum's brother done a DNA test and, and they trace back to the Khazars I think which is uh, the people who converted to Judaism and their family were actually uh, nomads they were from um, uh, well, they the furthest back you can trace them was from France and then they, then they then they were in exile, they went to Germany and then they went, they're like nomads, they're known as uh, black gypsies and uh, then they went to, after the Jews in the palace settlement in, in Prussia or Russia, the Soviet Union and all the Jews were kicked out, M my family on my mum's side uh, came from that that time and that place and they um, uh, I'm really tired now I better stop yeah and they were uh, um, come from they went to Russia where the, the Jews were the Pala settlement which was where the Jews were persecuted and the pogroms and they fleed and then years later the, there's an initiative and I reckon it's by the Catholic Church at the time of Napoleon and they went to when the because the Tsar of Russia was very friendly to Jews and my mum's family went went out there to live and settle and they went they had to walk there to their uh, uh, land and they had to walk all through Russia and they slept it, they had to dig holes and when they got there they had no home, they had to build their home and um, my, my uncle done all the family history and he, he he'd done a DNA test and it come back that he was from that, um, it, that he was they were originally from that way that their ancestors so they'd been like on a full circle and a going from one, one country to another and uh, they took up the pala, they took up the residence where the Jews had been thrown out and the Pala settlement which was a like a ghetto area for the Jews they were segregated from the rest of Russia and then the Tsar 
didn't like the Jews and they got all kicked out and then it then the Tsar changed. And then our family, under the hand of the Catholic orders of the powers, encouraged people to go out there and settle and they promised them all this wonderful, you know, wonderful promise. But when they got there, barren plains and... Uh, anyway, they made a, jo a job of it and, you know, done more than you can expect. Uh, and so, um, my mum's family comes from that side, but he traced his lineage back and he wasn't, um, he wasn't from, apparently, w weren't Jewish, but my nan might have been, so, and he was an orphan and he grew up in Canada, so after, Ru after Russia they got kicked out because the, the Tsar changed and they like persecuted my mum's family and they put all the men in barns and, and the young boys and set light to them and raped all the women um, but they, my mum's my, my side escaped and they got back to America and they settled in uh, Dakota in Canada and uh, and that's where my granddad come from that married my mum's mum and uh, I believe he was an he was an orphan and traumatised as a child or had a very traumatic childhood and then the whole family got broken up because uh, the mum died when he, that he was born or just after he was born or giving birth, I can't remember and so he didn't have no memory of his mum and the father became an alcoholic he couldn't cope and he'd, lost, he'd been swindled out of his farm because he couldn't pay a payment and it was really, uh, reading between the lines, it was like a scam and they publicly sold his farm for a pound in, in a public square and uh, to the local masons kind of thing, the local people, you know, local councillors or the local force, the local power, the people had authority and they took, it took his farm off him because he couldn't make the last payment. And he'd been faithful on his payment, and he'd brought, uh, made enough money to buy extra equipment, and also loan equipment to other people. But when he went to recover that that um, money that he'd lent out to people and that equipment that needed paying for, they all welched on him. So he could have been set up for that. And then his house, he publicly was sold for a dollar. So he'd built his own house. Uh, worked his own land and he was in profit but he he didn't have any cash flow so because he didn't meet the bank payment they took it off him and then they were uh, then he, then he couldn't then then his wife died and then he just couldn't cope he had 14 13 or 14 children and my granddad was the youngest my mum's mum was the youngest so when um when the when the wife died, he just hit the bottom. He couldn't cope. He had a breakdown and uh, completely uh, hit the bottle, which is tragic, really, because of the effects it had on the, all those children. And some of them were sold off. One one was prostituted, you know, just taken privately and was used for sex. And and uh, I think they killed. I think I think she killed the bloke. He was raping her and she spent her life in a mental hospital, a section there. And then she got out and made a, a great success of her life. And all the, all the children got scattered. So my granddad had that upbringing and he, he, he went into a family. Now my granddad never spoke any at all about his history. He just didn't, you know, it was a closed book. And my uncle Brian, my mum's brother, done the research and picked up little pieces here and there to get a rough idea of the you know, the tragedy they faced and you could kind of see the trauma that he 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 started off, you know, not knowing his mum, being blamed for her death by the other other siblings and uh he went with one brother and he didn't have any knowledge of his other family. He he was too young to remember. And so was his brother, they were both I think they were the youngest two, and uh, or, or the youngest half. He was the youngest, and uh, I don't know how old his brother was. Not that much older, I don't think. 
And so I wonder about their home life because Canada's famous for MK Ultra. So the family could have adopted, adopted him, could have been, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I can't confirm this, but it, uh, knowing about the practice, it, I wonder if it, they were like uh, Satanists or they might have been lovely people, but he might have been happy there. I, um, but his trauma, trauma experience and being an orphan when he joined the army, that that could have flagged up the the activity, and he could have been uh, programmed and handled. And he was the one who uh, triggered in and tried to destroy me. He'd lost it, and then I think he realised what he'd done, and then I saw him hesitating, and, and then I could sense he, he was going to get rid of the evidence of what he'd done, because I was in a right mess, I was just lacerated in all, all, all over and bleeding. And I could tell he was going to fly at me, he was sort of in a, in a, almost like a possessed but almost triggered to be a killer, you know, just base and a beast and he, I could see him thinking about it pacing and I could tell what was building up and I kind of pointed my finger at him and told him no but then he started, then he was going to fly at me and that's when I collapsed and that's when I had an experience where I believe the Lord translated me in a blink and he couldn't, he couldn't finish the job and then that was all concealed and I wondered if he was triggered or, or so I'm look, I was all, I've always been looking for the, that sort of hands because I've seen a pattern of, of keeping me in isolation and then all these hands moving behind the door and then eventually those same hands that have been throughout my life have been in the building up to the Mormon church so there's all this all these activities connect and I wonder if he he was um, conditioned and I, I got I get the feeling that my my mum's mum the impression my mum's mum was Jewish she's got a Jewish surname and she was from quite a well-to-do family but because my nan married this man, I, I think they were kind of cut off. They were from like uh, Wimbledon or something, and they had all quite well to do. They had all hand crocheted uh, clothes and that in their pictures. But what I knew of my nan, she's quite poor, hard working. So is my granddad. So I don't know much about that history, but only a few snippets. But they, seeing them as young girls, they had really, really, you know, fine lace clothes with all. Uh, embroidered uh, like doily type bits and posh shoes and uh, really immaculate clothes. So they must have had some money, must have been quite a middle class family. But then they were cut off for some reason and uh, married my granddad. So I wonder if there's like hands involved or whether it's just Satan. And he knows I'm the seed, like one of the seeds, one of his. Uh, children of Israel so I've, I've had all these impressions throughout my life that I'm from that from that seed and then that Satan has just used every opportunity to get me and, and ruin my life but I do believe that there's hands involved because I've seen these hands involved and I think they're organized but they don't know I don't think they fully know what's going on because they're deceived but there is organizations in it occult bodies I'm pretty sure and, and I think uh, to get into the Mormon church that was all conspired, that was all designed well that was an option and that was chosen and then I had this patriarchal blessing, it said a lot of incredible things in it so I, I thought well it almost suggested I was going to be a general authority it basically said that in the when I, you, you have a patriarchal blessing you go to somebody who's been called to be a uh, they call it a 70 and he's uh, set apart to give uh, inspiration from the God the Father. Of course it, it isn't from God the Father, but that's what they believe. And then that they give uh, personal revelation to every member of the church of their uh, um, future and their blessing. 
what tribe they're from and because uh, they all believe that uh, the Mormons believe that, that most members of the church are from the church of Ephraim or Manasseh something like that so in my patriarchal blessing I was from the tribe of Ephraim but it says that with everyone so I didn't I never really took it I took it with a pinch of salt and I, I don't know if it you know obviously that's not revelation from God so I can't go by that but other experiences I've had and I think the Mormon church is seeking the seed of Israel to get it in itself so somebody knows what blood you are what bloodline you are and they're following it and I'm looking at my granddad's life thinking you know we're, 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 the way you met my nan is almost like targeted her but I'm not saying that the, the, that was the case but he went to uh, where my nan was having a local dance and he tripped her up as she's coming out of the out of the hall covertly tripped her up and then um, you know stepped in to be the charm you know and I thought oh. when I heard that story I thought that's a bit deceptive a bit deceitful you know most people wouldn't see anything wrong with it I think that's quite romantic you know I think that's a uh, deceptive and he may have even known what he was doing or been led by the devil to do that I don't know but anyway they were in love my nan loved him but my granddad was very hard and hot you go into the room it's like um, a hot coal giving off a get away from, you know stay away from me kind of impression and that and I think that come from his uh, obviously his, his life and he singled my mum out um, against um, what all the things my mum told me because my mum used to offload on us when she, you because know, she had so much on her heart and I don't think she'd offload it on anyone else like her family but she, she used to let us know because we were close and she used to tell us how her dad treated her, singled her out, humiliated her, put her down so it was a really controlling thing and my mum could never work out why she was the only one treated like that you know why she was singled out and then then I learned about trauma based conditioning it all fits the pattern so whether my granddad was involved with it I get a suspicion some of my mum's family know but I, I can't clarify it so I can't really say for, say uh, if it's a fact one way or the other and I love my family I'd, you know uh, I wouldn't want to be wrong and, and uh, give false assertions I'm just being honest about that. that's the impression I get so I have to remain separate from my family because I believe I, I've seen that activity in a few of my cousins trying to handle me now whether they're being led by Satan in, or just you know being absent of any uh, foundation and they're led around by impulse by their own desires but I've had a lot of uh, suspicious uh, calculated treatment like a narcissistic behaviour and which reinforce the trauma based conditioning you see so it's like they, they've got some knowledge of it and I get the sense that, uh, that one of my uncles short changes me and, so, and I think he's part of it because I ask him questions and he sort of dodges the answer and I get the impression he's, uh, he's aware of it and possibly part of it. So I wonder if my granddad was uh, richly abused, and only perhaps there's people in his family that uh, know about it, and there's others who don't. And so my mum had this treatment. I had the isolated beating behind the, behind the garages, and then that was kept secret. And then all that practice followed me. So I, I that was one. One of the impressions, just one of the impressions where I, I believe that I am one of the seed of Israel. And the relationships were all staged. My mum meeting my dad was all staged. My mum uh, was approached to get us to move to this area when I was about 12. And, and, and looking back on it, that was like a setup. They set her up to play on a desire to have a bigger house for. Uh, we were we were we lived in a little two bedroom terrace. It was puny, and uh, I used to share a room with my brother. My dad just put two wardrobes back to back and then built a, a door. 
so we had a partition so we had our own room so it was only one room and so my mum was always looking for a bigger house so the way that we, we moved, my mum got a bigger house was um, she was approached and that's what, you know my mum was always approached by people you know take this dog or you know how would you like this or you know wouldn't you it's almost like set up and that kept gets us to this area you see and then they were, it's almost like they want you in a certain area and, and, and when you want to do things that you want to do they go wrong and they're scuppered someone gets in the way and puts a bosh on it and then your then your options are limited and then you're steered by crude measures and I go back to that doctor somebody that high priest was involved with something and he maliciously gave false witness to that doctor and that handled that that made me without two doctors and I struck off two doctors so when other professionals get a report from other professionals they're going to get a false account so I, the treatment continues like domino so all the doors close and that's how I've been treated at school how I've been treated in uh, the doctors have been treated in the NHS and other people don't get that treatment they don't see it so it's almost like people are aware of treating to pits, certain people in that vein and I think that's the seed of Israel and the, my trauma abuse was part of that conditioning and then they got plans for you you see and they, they want you to they got a role for you they got they got something in mind for you that they want and, part, and I think part of that was getting us to move to this, this area and they've tried to control me by uh, remotely you know like um, remote targeting and getting a control of my mind and thoughts suggesting they own me and they're netted around me, camped around me and uh, they've always been there and they've infiltrated local I mean, uh, like services where they they control and run it and the people in it aren't aware of what's going on so I get processed a different way to most people get processed uh -huh. so I do wonder about that and um, I've got memories of my own trauma anyway I'm going to close from falling asleep and I'll finish off later Right, I'd like to finish off my testimony cause I, uh, of how I got netted into Mormonism and uh, I felt like I was falling asleep last night and uh, I thought I'd better stop because I was losing my train of thought um, I opened my Bible last night just flipped the page open and uh, just looking for some uh, comfort I suppose and, I, and it opened it uh, Second Thessalonians, chapter 3. So I'm going to read that, just see what I read. Uh, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be, and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do, the, do and will do the things which we command you. Excuse me. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he, was, which he received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we have behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labour and travail night and day, that we might not be charged to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not not at all, but are busy bodies. Now then, that are such we command and exhort by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye brethren, be not weary in well doing. And if any man obey not, um, not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord put peace himself, give you peace always by all means, the Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, uh, I, I, I opened that straight away, and it was uh, what struck me was um, uh, that we may be delivered from an unreasonable and wicked man, for men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. So, just to thank and praise God that, uh, that the Lord is faithful. And he's delivered me from uh, Mormonism and uh, evil men and uh, kept me safe and established me. Um, when I when I left the church, and now I was probably a member, uh, um, it, that was over a period of 15 years, so I only really had nearly a year of activity or adding it all up, going, going into uh, meetings and that. And before before I, I, I escaped, and uh, most of that time I just didn't go to church, but never really uh, grew much in the word because I just like um, keeps your focus. It keeps your blinkers away from the cross. It keeps your blinkers away. Keeps your eye off the prize of the Lord. Keeping your eye single, and it um, took me a long time to realising and what what the cross was really about and although I'd read it loads and loads and loads of times it just hadn't sunk in at that point and um, when I came eventually uh, did leave after that experience of uh, Easy Kill 34 and uh, that, that episode with that uh, lady the following day and those uh, uh, reading that the prophet what they taught and then I realised that they taught loads of things like there was people on the moon and uh, it, that really opened my eyes and then then the Lord started to establish me because then I started looking for born again Christians and uh, I had the internet at that time so and I found this um, there was something I heard and it hadn't registered and it was mocking the uh, Mormon comics about Heavenly Father having loads of gods. Now I'd never heard, you, you wouldn't believe this, but I'd never heard that doctrine. How there was uh, many gods and father, there was many fathers. Now that never got to our ears in our world. Um, that was something I'd never heard that there was, that God had many wives sort of thing. I knew about polygamy, but uh, that, that was as far as it went. And then the church taught you how oh, that was um, practiced once, but it was stopped. And then you're so you're so numb and dumbed down that you you're indifferent. You don't question things. Um, and if you believe the hook that uh, it's the only true church, or, or or whatever feelings you get, I, I never had a burning in the bosom. Uh, I've heard people say about the burning in the bosom. I, I just thought, what are they on about? What's burning in the bosom? Um, it just it, it just be on me, but uh, people do have uh, these uh, spiritual feelings that aren't aren't the Holy Spirit, so they must be demonic to have a, um, a burning in the bosom, or so that must be a, a way that it's confirmed. And I wonder if it's sometimes it's uh, somebody on the end of it giving you the burning on the bosom with some electronic device or something. It, it makes me wonder. But I, I left, once I did leave, um, I was looking on the internet and saw this cartoon and then, and then I thought, I thought oh, that's just mocking, mocking the church kind of thing. And then uh, the person who released that uh, video clip I saw, and this is probably the first time I'd ever come across YouTube and, and mostly YouTube was like, uh, 
uh, horrible because it was like a load of um, uploading people's films of uh, people slapping people and filming it or beating people up and filming it and putting it on YouTube. I thought it was completely, completely rotten and disgusting. And that was at the time when YouTube was rather wild and you, people were uploading things and, and things were remaining on there before people complained about it and they changed their ways kind of thing. But it was very con controversial. I thought, oh, I don't like this world, I don't like YouTube, I don't like the internet. I knew I knew that the compu my computer wasn't very secure. I knew I knew enough about computers to know that there was a load, load of money behind it. Somebody was behind rolling it out and taking advantage of people, and then leading people into it, and old, leaving old people behind, and vulnerable people, and then just showing people how to work the system, not really showing how vulnerable it is and how easy it is to manipulate. So I wanted nothing to do with it. How easy it is to hack it and how the operating systems are uh, closed software so you can't, you don't know how they work so you don't know what extra codes in there to give access to other people without your, without your awareness how easy it is to con people with fake sites and taking people advantage, gathering information and then Google Earth come out and I thought what, you know, there's all this um, security uh, you know about terrorism, fear of terrorism, I thought well how how hypocritical and contradictory that you can go on the computer and go, you know plan your bombing raid with a Google Earth or something, or you can get access to places where you're getting intelligence. So, and I thought this is this is this is mad. This world's going mad. And I caught caught this clip of this uh, uh, YouTube on YouTube of these um, Mormon thing cartoons mocking it and. And, and, and that opened my eyes to the doctrine. But it was from a guy, uh, born again Mormon, uh, Sean McCraney. And I, I caught it and I watched one of his shows. I went and I thought, ah. Oh. And he was speaking about uh, once saved, always saved. I never heard that doctrine. And I thought, ah, oh, that was very edifying. And I studied that through. I thought, oh, this is, you know, this is right. And I was praying to be led to find, you know, nourishment and un un understanding. And then, um, then, the, then the Godhead, and that I had that clarified, and you know, grew in understanding of the Godhead and the and faith alone in Christ alone. And I thought, oh, that's what I believe in. So you know, I started to study that for you and realise that. What the Holy Ghost had taught me, because because I I was quite childish, because I was uh, I didn't realise at the time, but I was di dissociated, which uh, I discovered later on that was a, a symptom of Joseph Smith's life. He was traumatised when his child had a he had a bone growth sawn out of his leg when he was conscious, and that traumatised him and dis dissociated him, and he used to have like uh, vivid fantasies and his imagination goes wild, which is like a uh, a way a child would would escape and shut out the trauma. You'd have like uh, flights of imagination, vain imaginings, kind of thing, but in a childish way. And I was very much like that, and suffering from that, but not really realizing the root of it. And then um, after a while, he he was very against uh, the the uh, organised religion is speaking out against uh, the organised religion and quite salty and standing his ground but then he seemed to have there was sort of like a, a load of people a load of people rallied round and uh, hammered him over it and he kind of backed down and then he went a bit all he walked a bit after that I think I, I wonder if he was blackmailed or threatened by this uh, ecumenical system and he start, started to waver a bit and then he changed his opinion on the Godhead. And then he said, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe, you know. And, I, and then I, I kind of went off him. And he wasn't um, a born-again Mormon. He was an ex-Mormon that was born again, but he called himself born-again Mormon. And I thought, oh, born again. You know, and, I, and that's the first time I heard, really heard the term born again, you see. And then I studied that out and realised that's the, you know, uh, receiving the Holy Spirit and uh, born of the Spirit. And I'd had spiritual experiences, even in the Mormon Church, walking in the Spirit and uh, 
you know, grown in grace. And I knew about grace. I did, under, the Lord gave me an understanding about grace, and uh, and I was picking up so much, so many things. And but the Holy, it, uh, the way I viewed it is like I, I swallowed the Holy Ghost kind of thing. That uh, that was my childish understanding. I swallowed the Holy Ghost, and I didn't realise that I had, had fellowship with the Heavenly Father and, and the Lord and dwelling in me and and being take born into heavenly places. I hadn't really captured that doctrine at the time but I knew I had the Holy Spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit had lifted me, edified me, taught me what was, you know, showed me things I could never have worked out myself, how, uh, what was untrue and, you know, you, you, you prompted that that's not right or there's something to untoward here, it gave me that discernment and then, uh, then I was praying, uh, you know, Lord, I ne never really had fellowship, hadn't broken bread, hadn't really... I wanted to be rebaptized, But I was in such a state that I needed to just keep myself away and recover and build myself up in the Word. And that's exactly what the Holy Ghost told me to do. That's what the Lord told me to do. And um, I'd done that and prayed and said, Lord, lead me to... You. What I really needed was some sober brethren and... Uh, so I was very unsober, and I could really have uh, moments of wildness, and uh, and then there was a danger of me falling back into like uh, drugs and getting high, and then that would affect the way I, my, you know, my thoughts would, my vain imaginings would take root. So that was very dangerous. So I had to uh, get that out, you know, keep that out of my life, and I'd been clean from it for many years but I did um, go back to it at one point when I was having a bad time and I heard about medical cannabis and different strains so I thought I want to try that and uh, and then I went through all that and then put that all behind me thank the Lord and uh, I wanted to, what I really needed was um, faithful brethren and I, and I prayed Lord you know lead me to some sober brothers and then I came across ex-Catholics for Christ and um, Patrick Patrick Patel's testimony of um, his childhood and the Holy Spirit was really um, encompassing and just com uh, comforting uh, uh, listening to his testimony and how simple it was and I thought this is this is more like it and then I started studying their works James, James Patel's work and then the rapture I heard the rapture and then I got um, all, all, all the things I didn't understand, I, I kind of learnt from, from James and, uh, and I studied those out. And I just thought, well, um, what, a, what a great ministry they had. And, uh, and I built myself up studying, studying theirs and, I, and then I'd view other, other teachings from other people through history and glean from Glean from their work what was what was right, and then certain things would trip me up and confuse me. So I went around, in, you know, kick around in circles. Uh, Mister like uh, Chuck, Chuck, uh, Chuck Missler uh, from Calvary Chapel, and then he since passed away. And there's another guy who sounded like John Wayne uh, from Blue Letter Bible. I think his name was Chuck. I can't remember. And I, and I studied their teachings and, uh, be, you know, became edified and built myself up in the Word. The Lord built me up in the Word. And then I grew from there. And then I stopped, I stopped, I had this notion I'll seek a church, but I realised there's no... I, I, then I discovered ecumenism and uh, the churches together and then the yoke, the whole lump, how it was corrupt and apostasy. And then I, then I realised the apostasy of the church which I saw that was from the very beginning and the church fell away early on. But the the body remains faithful, Christ is faithful. But I saw the body of Christ like a, a glass statue that shattered across the floor and I was very confused. I thought, well, where are the body of Christ? It's like everyone's teaching something completely different. It's not two people the same. And then until I, until I come across the, the ministries where they're more sober, they're more... 
uh, disciplined. And I realise there is very few few ministries that are uh, what I'd say more correct, more sober, more like uh, following the example of Paul. And then so that's that's how I, the Lord helped me build myself up in the Word through praying and seeking and then studying through all the different doctrines and then so I could come to my own understanding of uh, what's what but I, you know I don't know everything I haven't learned everything and I always try and leave myself open to reevaluate something like uh, another doctrine in case uh, you harden your neck in something and then you're set in your way so I didn't want to be in error I wanted to find that heart you know that we that we all should have I think but it seems the people won't give up on their positions and you get criticized or and then you think well you're being accused of something they're doing themselves they, they don't seem to want to give on their question their uh, doctrine and then then it kind of confused me with the diversity and then I just realized well you know you no good worrying about other people you just got to make sure that um, I was straightened and being straightened and and so that's how I grew and then I had you know solar scriptura or, or the soul the final authority of the believer in the holy scriptures and in which bible I thought, and I only had one bible so I never knew there was all these different versions and then I um, I studied that through, studied, uh, I never heard about the Reformation, I was completely, na I was com completely naive. <coughs> so I studied the Reformation and what all that was about and saw the, um, the main gist of it, faith alone, Christ alone and the uh, soul authority, the scriptures, learned about all the history of the coming forth of the Texas Receptus and the other versions and how that was a faithful route and and then the coming forth of the translation of the King James Bible from uh, King James the First of England and how he uh, gave everything up to kind of get it to the public and had it commissioned to be uh, translated by um, a law lawful witnesses and translators to thrash it out and lawfully come up with a standard um, canon and I thought that was incredible and that was my testimony I was praying to know well I'd come across this ex real real extremes that the Bible had to be uh, you know any little one word out of place and it was no good kind of thing and then uh, and then all these other liberal opinions of, um, uh, you know, the scriptures are in here, the, you know, the words preserved in all of the scriptures, and and I brought uh, an NIV version, and uh, it's horrible, really, and, and and that just confused me more because there's things missing in it, and uh, I didn't realise whole chapters missing, and uh, uh, the certain names changed, so I, I got rid of that quickly stuck with my King James, built, uh, increased my testimony on that by studying it and uh, coming to, coming to that uh, complete um, faith in, in the Word of God and, and a faithful translation and, and having a faithful copy as, as much as possible, you know, as humanly possible because a lot of the old, even a lot of the new King James, old King James versions of there's errors in them so uh, I grew I grew in the study and uh, my testimony of the word and the and the uh, faithfulness of the Lord and it's continuing on with me throughout my life delivering me from those evil men and uh, so that's how I I, I grew and, uh, and 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 carried on going and uh, so that's been a wonderful blessing, a wonderful testimony to a not not be too washed around in religion to start with, or raised in a religious system, and then coming out of the system, I, I kind of was a, a blank sheet, and then I picked up all the bad, and then come out and learn out and 
and learnt from the contrast what was straight, what was true. And that the church body is, you know, you've got members in all, all sorts of uh, churches. There's quite the body of Christ, quite diverse. But it is apostate. There is a lot of apostasy and error. So uh, that's that's an ongoing work of the Lord. And in all of us, so I, I kind of uh, continued on in and uh, stuck with that which remained and. Uh, got rid of that which was, was not doing me any good, associating to apostasy, it, it affects your own testimony, so you, I had to uh, separate things I didn't see that were agreeable, like it says in there, if anyone's disorderly, come out from among them, because you don't want to partake of their sins, and, and have those sins, because those sins will develop in your own, in your own walk, or you might follow opinion rather than study it through to check if it's real. You just uh, repeat what they, what what Pastor A says or Pastor B says or Teacher A says, and then if you follow that without really knowing and just believe it, you become worse than that person, and that will affect other people in your in your life. Your testimony will be uh, fractured or skewed a bit. So uh, the Lord built me in the Word, but I want to get 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 back to. I want to finish this off now because it's probably run into hours. So I'd like to finish off um, how about trauma-based conditioning and how I've seen that in my family. But I have uh, absolutely no confirmation of what's what. So I kind of um, and I have other memories, of, uh, slight memories of other things that take place, which I'm not one hundred percent about. But uh, they're strong enough to compare with other experiences I had to know that even though I was dissociated and blocked out the memory of what happened to me as a child and that never came to the surface until I was about 36 so that was 34 years kind of with not remembering that event so I know I knew you kind of have the, uh, the impression that something happened, but you c it's just completely out of your reach, out of your, out of your mind. And, and when I experience these uh, vivid flashbacks of uh, child abuse and uh, being sold and like passed around to private people, and just a very vague memory of that, which I'm still not a hundred percent sure but I know I kind of know but I, I don't know if you know what I mean and so I have to patiently uh, wait till that's resolved <coughs> and that was to do with my mum and my mum wouldn't and knowing my mum I thought no, she would never do anything like that but then I started to realise how these people work about they compromise people they blackmail people and they get something on people they may set people up for something and then they might twist their arm to do something and they're so frightened of that um, getting out that they do it you see and and, and I wondered if this that was in uh, that 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 was going on with my mum because she concealed uh, my mum was the one who recovered me after her granddad uh, after my my granddad her dad and my my mum had to hold a knife to his throat to when she left home so I don't um, I don't know everything that went on between my mum and my granddad and I don't know everything or hardly anything about my granddad's life I know he had a very hard life and so um, and I knew him as a character uh, full well I knew what he was like and uh, I never you know I love him, I never, when you're a child, you just, you're innocent, you love everybody. And um, I started investigating, uh, hearing testimonies about trauma-based conditioning, MK Ultra, and I studied that through, still studying that through, and researching, trying to cut through all the, uh, the, the pollution that comes into the people's testimonies, how distorted 
uh, things can become and you get all these diverse variations of the same thing. People state as a fact that they were in these programs and then you, you realise that there's, there's so much variation of different people's experiences and uh, but there are people who've been in actually on the end of a program where they've you know there's lots of people being on the same thing and they've met one another in this program so um, my, my life was not, not quite like that it's more isolated as far as I'm aware but I did used to have a lot of people come up to me locally and state that they knew me and they had that um, I know you I've seen you before and I had it so many times and you know, I started to question, well, what's all that about? Why do people think they know me? I don't know you. You know, I've never seen you in my life. I've got a pretty good memory. But when I started to remember this trauma, I wondered, well, have, have I been involved in some, you know, satanic rituals, you know? Um, and then that's where it kind of points to that there's a big community of people. And... Uh, when you're traumatised you're in a kind of trance and then you will not and when you're smashed like that you, you're very vulnerable to uh, possession or familiar spirits or demonic um, demonic entities getting into your life and overtaking you and when you disassociate you're not it's like you've left your keys in the car and climbed over into the boot and gone to sleep and wrapped yourself in a blanket and somebody, something else takes over, and I think that's part of the conditioning. When when you traumatise a child, they don't remember, and then they're abused by a load of people that you see. You see their faces, but when you come out of that trauma, you have no memory of it because you put it. You climb out of the boot, and then all that memory goes in it, and you get back in the driving seat, and it's though, though what was going on while you were in the boot, is switched. So you never, you never meet the two. And that's what I kind of discerned in my own life. So some, I was part of some ritual in a local area and it's quite big and organised and I think it goes quite high up because um, it's a, th these uh, organisations are established in, in, in all walks of life. You know, these people are... When, when, when I study other testimonies, you see that they're you know, they're in, they could be in the police force, it could be in the doctors, it could be in the establishment, the civil service, and then you just don't know how big these things are and how long they've been going on. And so I knew I was part of some local paedophile. Um, that, that's the impressions I'm, that are leading to. And when I was traumatised, my mum was the first one to scoop, scoop me up, put me in my pushchair and then I completely passed out and blacked it out and then the next time I woke up I had no memory of it so I can't even remember anything from that point on and where my mum would have taken me because um, my dad wasn't aware of it and I think my dad was completely traumatised and handled handled away from my birth and he's got no memory of it and, he, and uh, the person at my birth was my the one who abused me, my granddad and so my dad doesn't know where he was and they worked at the same place so that could be easily been arranged that he, he could have been kept away and then my granddad could have been popped in his place so that that rung up a red flag of suspicion you know that's odd and I'd always question my circum birth circumstances to my mum that's always the tale I got that my granddad was there and I thought well where was my, where was my dad and I used to ask him where were your dad and he can't remember and he generally can't remember as far as far as I can tell. But I do I do question if he, he's aware of something. But it looks like he was uh, traumatised as a child and he's completely disassociated and he, he he's just able to function. Um so I, I, I started to question and I don't know, so I can't really I don't want to point the finger at my family, but I'm these are just um Uh, impressions I got that there's a compromise and I've seen that in other people's families how they how you're blackmailed and or frightened and it doesn't have to be direct it can be indirect 
and you could have your arm twisted by circumstances like uh, people can show that they're hovering around your family you know they're there but your family don't and you know that they're, they're, their intention is evil and that if you do anything out of order they're going to live out the threats that they're suggesting and uh, I wonder what the hold is on my mum to get me th th that would ever get her to do that to kind of um, lease me out kind of thing and I have physical evidence that memories of physical evidence of uh, a semen in, you know when I was going to the toilet and I was a really small child and uh, wondering what what it, what that was because it was like odd and so you know so many things point to these things and then other memories started coming back when I walked around a, a local park and uh, there's these um, covert people fo netting me and following me and they were kind of leading me to this park and I um, I kind of wanted them to come out in the open and I was, um, they were communicating with me through signals and leaving little messages under a bridge and I thought well, and they were kind of trying to suggest things and I wanted to call them out and because of Foyster to Skull they can communicate so I wanted to stop communicating because they gave me the impression that they were f friends not foes. And I thought, well, if your friends come out in the open, and I and I uh, signalled to them that I wanted to meet them in an open park, and they kind of signalled that, that I got a a signal from a multi-storey car park. I said, if you if you want to come out in the open, sig signal me. And then I got this signal from a multi-storey car park. I was walking under the bridge and a, I saw a bucket be placed on top of a where cars park, a red bucket in a square. And that was a signal, so I was looking for that signal. And I went down into the town to, do, to buy a keyboard. And uh, I saw a, a signal with a red, little red square in a cardboard, you know, blacked out and then a flap come up and I saw a red signal and I thought, oh, there's a signal there. They've commu they communicated back. So that was phys physical evidence that these, the people on the end of the voice to skull were there. But they, I don't think they were. Whether, I, I don't know, but um, it led me to uh, a house, a big house in the state which I started to get flashbacks and memories and I, I kind of started to traumatise. And I couldn't, uh, I had to get home, I had to walk back home. And I was being followed and tailed because I could see them signalling to one another. I caught two of them signalling. So I knew how they net you and someone orchestrates and coordinates the movement so they can see you. And then they coordinate people to follow you and trail you. So no matter where you are, they, they can just put a person up in front of you or behind you. So I caught two people. Um, in that team, and I, and I could tell by their um, uh, their apparel that they'd been sleeping rough and they hadn't eaten, and they were kind of like hard, disciplined people, you know, sh unshaven, slept in the woods, kind of thing. And I, and I I've been around many people who live like that, so I could see that that's the sort sort of lifestyle they'd had. So they were on a on duty kind of thing and they hadn't you know that they, they had to see it through so I was being netted by all these different uh, tags and I thought I was that that's kind of like SAS kind of style and then I was led to this park you see and that was my idea but that might have been that, that might have been suggested for me to have that idea and I don't know and then I come across this house in a state which brought these vivid memories back and it's a big posh mansion, housing estate of mansions, kind of like detached houses. And I started to get these memories back of uh, being led across from one house into the next one. And, and then, uh, then I got to this park and had other impressions. And then I saw this uh, like old a grove of trees, an old uh, gothic 
architecture, fountain and a, a little grave and a plaque to all these dead children and uh, all these different suggestions and I thought uh, that's something to do with what I've been through uh, that's what I was being led to find and see <coughs> and I was all, pr all, all through this I was praying to be led and um, I read the scripture about learn, praying to learn about dark sayings and, I, and I'd done that and this is how I uh, was led out to signal to these people and call them out and that led to the meeting, but they never turned, they never showed their face. They made an appearance by showing me that they were there, but they didn't come out in the open. And uh, so I, I didn't want to. I, I thought, well, they're not genuine then. And I, I, I headed back home, and on the way home, I had more impressions of uh, going past this other house, which was related to when one of my mum's brothers lived. And then I, then I started to wonder about the association and then with my mum. What did, was somebody blackmailing her? Was that, or was she part of a, in a cult in her family that not, not all of her family were aware, but some of them were. So because I don't know, I have to keep away from my family. Um, just in case that they are compromised and the people are handling them in the family to get other people to to influence or ask questions or control or plant seeds of doubt or stir up stir up lies about me or just in case um, you know I get the knife stuck in me and people try to discredit me who are in there who are trying to discredit me as a, this that or the other and I've kind of had people feeling me out finding what's going on and I've been looking out for it and then, then I see it come through you know more p people who, who who wouldn't do that but are on the end of something because someone's got them to come around and I've had that a few times so I can see see where it's coming and I've had handling within in the family by certain males and it took me a while to figure out what what they were doing and uh, how they were trying to control me, handle me. So they had some knowledge of uh, trauma-based conditioning, and I thought, well, where, who taught you that? You know, this isn't this isn't you naturally. This is uh, somebody teaching you how to do this, how to trigger you, and then uh, start um, making you doubt yourself and throwing in. Uh, I know that you know, completely denying. And because you're isolated, you, you want to tell somebody, and then you want that affirmation and like somebody to understand. That's all you're looking for. But when they're undoing it, and so you know, you're paranoid kind of thing. And then, then you show them the evidence, and then they don't even go and research it. They just tear it apart. So you think, well, well hang on a minute. You, this is starting. I started to see that that was deliberate uh, control. That was. Um, Somebody and someone's on the end of that compromise. So I think this is how families are controlled, that they are compromised in some way. And then a family member will have to do something on someone's behalf. And, and then when I started studying the secret societies and masons and how they uh, set honey traps for, like the CIA set, prost got these prostitutes, and rather than prosecute them, I said, you can work for us, you see, so there's a compromise. And they go, okay, I'll save my neck rather than, uh, and then I'll compromise other people. And then that's how the compromise can, starts to get control and gets a grip. So I thought, well, I'm not going to be compromised. And I want to stay away, I need to stay away from anybody that may be compromised, whether they're aware of it or not. And so I started to finally see that certain people are a bit darker and cagey and they're having more of an influence on the rest of the body you see so I thought ah they're, they're, I can see the avenues I'm not going to name names but um, I can see that there is something there and in relating everything to my trauma based conditioning I, I started to realise well someone's got a handle in our family and then, then I've seen it through history you see and I thought oh that's how it's done and then uh, so that's where I was with that and I started to discover all these things and that, that was following me in 
that that was around me before I joined the Mormon Church. I, so as soon as I was saved, there's people there steering me into the Mormon Church. And I reckon uh, that hearing that radio interview on, on the radio that day was not a coincidence. So, I, so that was um, possibly a set up, because it's a local radio station, so considering the connections people have, Freemasonry, you get all these different connections and covens and groups like that, they've got fingers in everything so they can make things happen you see and make it sound like magic oh that's a coincidence I heard Mormonism on the radio today you know and, and that radio was in this guy's office and I was meant to hear it you see so it, it, re, it reaffirms the their false testimony so I started to see the setups and how people are compromised and how organised these uh, masons are so I think it's to in, involved with Freemasonry, and then, and I think, and I've read later testimonies where there, there's been paedophile abuse and child rings in Freemasonry. It's one of their little perks, their little secret perks. And then most people going to Freemasonry aren't aware of it. They're just the charity face that they stick out the in the window shop. And these people never question because they're like, um, you know, it's a secret layered uh, society, so they don't ever get anywhere in it. You know, you just go however high up they go, they're never going to see what goes on really from the top down. They only see where they are from the bottom and the steps they've taken up, 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 up the elevator kind of thing, up the elevation of the craft. So I could start to see the dark arm, investigated all the dark arm of the... the uh, and having the discernment of how these things work, having the, the understanding of the Holy Spirit, the diversities of operations, how these uh, organisations are established and how they work. You know, so I could see, I could start to see that and then look for the pieces. Well, this is how it works. And now I find the components and then you start to spot them. But you can't, you can't really get any um, confirmation because they're not going to come out and say, oh yeah, unless somebody uh, repents and then whistleblows on their experience and makes it public and I've not I've, I, that's happened in other areas but not not in the area of my life so I, I patiently wait on the Lord for people to um, you know their consciences to be troubled and it break eventually the truth will break out whether it you know whether what I suspect is true or not whether what the impressions I've had are true or not I don't know so I kind of patiently wait and reevaluate my circumstances. But certain things I can't dismiss because I know, because I, you know, I've experienced them. So that's how they get um, MK Ultra trauma based conditioning. And then I've seen it follow me throughout my life, all the way up to school. Uh, some of it can be Satan and they're just the, the way the establishment's set up and then the natural order of the human race and how Satan can move people and reinforce the the more um, support, the more organised activity so it, it, it seems bigger than it actually is, they seem to be more powerful than they actually are and and they're aware of that's how Satan moves so they, they're aware they've got allies even though they don't, you know, there's, things work to their favour and reinforce their, uh, their craft and so I see. I saw it following me around, and and when I come to, um, after I was saved, I started getting all this voice to skull and this abuse and telling me I was evil and going to hell and all these different lies, one thing after the other. Not been here for anything consistent. Then I realised, oh, because that isn't working. They try something else. So I could start to see the human mindset behind the fruits of what was happening to me. So that was before I went and joined the church and because I was going through all that um, all these voices and stuff and I thought oh, I'd keep that to myself and I had the Holy Spirit so I knew that I was sober and conscious and straight I had this conflict of all these voices so I had to you know just ignore it and I completely ignored all the suggestions all the impressions and put it down to familiar spirits and uh, eventually that they subsided but they didn't subside because they weren't familiar spirits there's people on the end of it subsiding when I got into the church so I was getting all this oppression to lead me into the church and when I got into the church that all stopped 
But then I come out of the church, it all happened again, and I just was so strong, strong and built up by then. I I told them to get on their bike, get lost, and then then they then it went silent. All these I was getting all this abuse one night through the through the walls. Oh, uh, you're you know trying to resurrect what they'd done to me before, and I just went on your bike, and it, and, and it and it just kind of went silent. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I thought, well, you know that shocked them. So I knew that there was a uh, human hands on the end of it. And I'd learnt about all this technology, the soundboards, and how they can uh, target sound, invisible sound through radio waves into your brain, and your brain trans uh, translates it into voices. So that's what I was experiencing. And that's organised, and that's involved with the Mormon Church, and the Mormon Church is involved with the cult, and it's parallel to uh, Freemasonry. It's got Freemasons in it. When I joined the church, they, they told me if I, if I was a Freemason or anything like that, I wouldn't be allowed to be a member. And then <laughs> and then you find out that there's general authorities that are 33 degree Masons, and then there's local people that are Masons, and you think it's one rule for one. If, if you're a good person, they think, well, he's not one of us, he's never going to be able to compromise. And, we, and, and later on up through their elevationary system, the priesthood, they're gonna, there's going to be that same criminal element inside there and they're only going to elevate people to their advantage. So once they realise that you get pe you get a member that doesn't believe in any of it, and there are people that have come out openly and said, oh, you know, Mormons are really gullible, they're easy to flee. So you get this, it, it's, it, it's a place where the vampires pray, and they're in, in amongst, amongst the general body. And they, um, and it, you know, they get off on it, because they can hide under this... Uh, umbrella of legitimacy and a lot of people are just so naive and ignorant that they don't they're not aware it's going on around their families so they know who to spot and bring into their little inner clique and so I discern there's lots of people compromised in the, in the ward that are in that inner clique but the, a few people most people aren't and uh, so I started to see how it all worked and how it had been following me and how these uh that how it's Freemasonic and they are associated to the other bigger Freemasonry groups. So, you know, you think of the uh, Mafia and if you're running, you're on their patch and you're running a hot dog stand and you haven't got their permission, you're going to get your business sabotaged and you're, you know, they're, they're only going to let the, the people they want to operate operate and then you see that this kind of behaviour goes through the official channels as well. People get key positions like market stalls and things and other people never get a look in. It's all in it's all in the it's all in the house kind of thing. It's all it's all in the bag. Somebody's all got their fingers in in, in, in the pie in all the pies. And then you start to see the pattern of this throughout communities and then you wonder how, how organised are they, how infiltrated are they into each avenue of uh, service provision, each avenue of civil service and and then you think it only takes a few, a few supervisors here and there and they can control the whole lot from um, and hide amongst it like they do in, in the church and, and that's how the abuse goes on. So from the top you know everything about everybody in the ward so you can basically gauge and if you're part of it you can raise your children amongst it and uh, you know just um, abuse the circumstances of your position and deceive your deceive your own family and uh, so I can see how you know it's all it's all to do with a hold on compromise so one will compromise one and then it, if people are compromised, they're too frightened to say anything because it exposes their own guilt or shame for something that they've perhaps been set up to feel shameful about. Because that's how they get you. They, they, they lead you into a position where you do something and that you're ashamed of, and you're not going to, you don't want it to be mentioned in public because it will it ruin your family life, it ruin your career or it ruin that, you keep your mouth shut. So I think there's a lot of that going on in the Mormon church and people keep quiet or they're just frightened to say anything because it's a big or, or evil organisation and they can uh, get other hands to white glove you to do the dirty work, to get you hit and then to cover up the, um, cover up your care or make, 
you know, have influence in your with your GP. Tell you know, get them on their side. Get you know, uh, give false counsel and control circumstances. So I started to see this going on in my life. How all my circumstances were kind of like controlled, and I wasn't getting what I should have been getting. And when you tell other people, they say, "Oh no, that would never happen." You know, that, that's just completely illegal. You got a right to complain, kind of thing. But when you're a, a trauma-based dissociative you uh, trigger when you go to approach it, you just can't deal with it because you disassociate, you just can't face it, certain things. And when you're in, in private, if people know that you're a disassociate, they can trigger, the circumstances will trigger it and you go shut down into that, in the boot, and then they can say anything they like, and, they say, and people say things openly, and then you don't realise what had been said until you, perhaps later on you go, did they really say that? But you shut down because you, you don't want to be hurt. It's your condition not to um, be that way. You're crafted to be that way, and that's the craft. So it starts early on in your childhood, in the womb. Um, the practice is the younger you do it, the more the more powerful it is. So I, so I was a component. It was done in the womb, the development, the birth and then the violent abuse and then the sexual abuse, it's all the whole works but I've, there's certain things I haven't got a memory of because it's probably too too terrifying you know um, and I wonder what that I, what I was part of so I can see the at hands and the activity in the Mormon church leading into it and coming out so that was basically is my test my growing testimony because I, I, one way or the other I learn what's true and what isn't true as I go through and evaluate so I, I keep that open mind but when you try and chuck something away you go oh no that can't be true and think and the Holy Spirit brings you back to more and more and more you then then you come to a point where I can't dismiss this anymore I don't care what other people think of me you know whether they think oh, I sound really crazy you know, the Holy Spirit's always been affirming to me that these things are so. And, you know, to be yea, let ye be yea, and ye nay be nay. So that's what I'm doing, just being honest about my my uh, discernment, what I'm sure not sure about, what I'm, I'm not sure about, or I don't know yet. And then there is a, um, a bit of paranoia that creeps in the you know smudges it a bit but um, you still have the Holy Spirit to get you past and through that and then the things that remain remain and the things you don't know remain that you don't know so you you, you become edified and then what, what you're edified with you won't get rid of because it's certain and it's built upon ab establishing evidence like it's like when you t when I, when you're saved you, you, you're given the everything the Lord gives you that he gives you the word, his word. He gives you his spirit. So you, you've got that uh, completion in God. So you've got, basically, you've got the whole of God's knowledge behind you. But you, you, you. You're not really aware that's what's taken place until you confirm that in the scriptures. But the Holy Spirit is confirming that in your life. And then you read Colossians 2, you're complete in the Lord. And then you go, ah, oh, yeah. And then you read that you you have fellowship, the indwelling spirit, and the Father and the Son, and... Because of Jesus, we're one with the Father. Because He's the Father is one with Him, and we've been brought into the body of Christ. So we're one with the Lord. So therefore, we're one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And then you don't really realise what's taken place in your life until you, you you're established in studying of the Word. So um, and then you can't get. Then it won't ever go away. It can't be taken away. It, you, your experience will never diminish once you've got that. And um, I don't. I, I think you could forget, and then after a long period of time, it would diminish. But I mean, it it's still there. You know, you've had that impression, and that impression, that testimony won't leave you, because once you're saved, you know, you're you've the Lord's with you wherever you go. Even if you're um, have had a head trauma injury and you can't remember anything in your life, you still you still have the indwelling Holy Spirit. That you would lose, perhaps lose a memory and knowledge of what you do have. So I don't think your testimony can go out. I think it can demolish and, and go really, you know, to, a, to so dim that you you, you could turn away. And uh, but I don't think you'd ever turn away completely. I think you just uh, give up. 
I still think you'd be you'd still remain a believer because you've got that impression. Um, so I think I want to wrap it up now. Um, so that was my testimony of Mormonism and how I was netted and how I've been followed and these this activities followed me out my life and um, still growing in understanding about this thing and then studying through other people's testimonies and the knowledge out there on uh, secret societies and how these things work building up my understanding and that's all through prayer it's all through trusting in the Lord to um, teach me that which is and that which is not and then you established your your understanding and your knowledge base although you know you still don't know everything you're just uh, but you're still complete in the the one who does know everything and that he will lead you so if you your relationship's been built up in the Lord and you've experienced that you carry on experiencing that so uh, that I will in future be edified further in this area you know and come to oh it did happen or it didn't happen and, and that was that was either um, a false impression that was a mis misleading spirit or that will turn out to be actually true because I got the physical evidence I know that something's happened so I just need to wait to find out well what what took place and, and will those memory will I get any more memories so I can only rely on Heavenly Father and the Lord to uh, do that in his own time and I trust him to I know he's faithful so um, that's what I'm holding on to just trusting in the Lord and uh, I continue to uh, grow and continue in my Christian walk thank thank the Lord thank thank the Father for the Lord Jesus and thank thank Jesus for his for his love of the Father and, and dying for my sins paying for my sins and understanding my life and being the only one there to care for my soul he could uh, lead me through this, get me over impossible, get me through the valley in the shadow of death, get me out of those evil people, get me out of the grasp of those evil, wicked people because they've got no faith, they don't believe, they don't know Jesus. And then the Lord teaches me to forgive them and love them and pray for them, you know, even though they may be, you know, beyond hope, you know, that's, you know, uh, that. You can't you can't quench the Lord's mercy and outstretched long suffering. He wants every man to be saved, and so the Lord leads you in how to heal, how to forgive. Because if you don't forgive, you be, you become angry and you you want to lash out. And when you've been hurt so much, it's so difficult to do. You have to put it. You have to put all your cares on on your on, on heavenly Father and the Lord's shoulders. And you can think you can forgive, but then you can be re-traumatized re and get angry again, and then you have to repent again and re renew your mind and uh, renew your forgiveness. You know, I, I mean, I've I've been up and down like a yo-yo with with people who've hurt me, and I wanted to hurt them back. And, but then you learn the scriptures where the Lord's avenger, vengeance is the Lord's. That's what the word says. So you have to trust the Lord with these things and. Uh, these people, if they don't repent, they get the just come up and but I don't wish that on them. I, w I want, you know, I want, I want to see people save, and also people want to see other people delivered from these experiences, and that, that I can learn and be edified from their testimonies. So um, I feel that's how the devil gets hold on people's families, indirectly and directly through other hands and through um, just circumstances. So that's, um, I think that's going to be about all all for, for, for now. But that's just, that's how I got drawn into Mormonism and then delivered without hands through the grace and love and mercy of the Lord, the grace of the Father, through the Son and the Holy Spirit, and it delivered me from those evil men and that uh, machination that's netted and uh, camped around my life. And that brings me back to the impression that uh, I'm a target, I've been targeted from birth, so somebody's had an... and, I, and I'd, I'd also studied on breeding programs, how, you know, human breeding programs, how these covens and things know about breeding. They probably know more about breeding genetics than most people. And if you think of um, all, uh, a lot of the high establishment, they have all the knowledge to breed in plants and things, so there's also breeding animals, breeding horses, 
it's all to do with breeding you see and so there's people with knowledge of bloodlines and breeding and how to if you mix this with this what's the result going to be is it going to be in the first child is it going to be in the second child what's the daughter's genetics going to be like and if you breed one gene with that daughter what's that going to produce so they that you know that's how they manipulate people life circumstances so they get that 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 person to meet that person and then they're around keeping an eye on it and then they have children there for ah we've got the children now let's kill that one and then keep this one and then they work on you that that kind of way and that the devil is leading that but the devil leads that through organized hands and teaches his seed uh, his um, how to do these things you know these are completely devoid of any love compassion and mercy these are evil evil in the most um, capital E uh, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men but the Lord faith who the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil so there is evil if you if you if you ignore that there's evil in the world you're a complete numpty and you, you're dead in your head and your conscience is seared and you're just hardened in your own sin and selfishness and you won't see these things happening to you because they can uh, be these people are organised and they they can just uh, walk all over you if you haven't got any knowledge the Lord said I'm at Hosea four I think four or six perhaps my people perish through lack of knowledge and I'm I'm as guilty of having no knowledge so I had to study 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 and re reevaluate those studies and and the Lord increased my understanding and. Uh, taught me about these things and I'm still learning about these things and there'll be people coming forth and the Lord will still be delivering people from these things and so there will always be um, other accounts to learn and grow from and and what 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 the Lord has already revealed in other people's lives that those people can grow from their experience so the edification will increase slowly in time so there's always hope to look forward to if you're in the dark and you don't know what's happened to you you have to be patient until the Lord leads you to somewhere to a little bit here and a little bit there and, and then after after a hundred pennies you've got a pound and a hundred pounds you you know you, you can it increases and that, that's how the Lord leads and teaches and edifies uh, line upon line that's how he's worked through through the body of Christ through the saints through Israel so that's the impression I've been given, I've been targeted because I'm a seed of Israel and then, then your, those seeds are followed and, and then the people around those seed are manipulating the circumstances because they're all high level elevated Freemasons or in that kind of craft and they're part of that, perhaps not um, elevated up through the top, they've elevated from the top down and they're amongst it and they are the controllers of it and the handlers of it and that goes higher up into the spiritual realms you know it's, they've been raised up by those forces by those uh, those evil forces in, in high places and then they write and, and then that's manifest in the human body so there's an organization that is um, raised up in those high places and those high seats and they've been on the earth for a very long time and, and, and historically they've always been there that's the beast that is but it's not not yet but it is it's active but it's just not not in power it's not in control so it's covert and uh it knows dark, all the dark sentences all the dark dark crafts because it's raised in those dark crafts and, and that's generational then they approach people in those lines so they know which people to approach hey you you're you're one of us you're dark so they can raise that component up in their craft to utilize them and if you're not in that, that, that vein, you're not going to ever see these things or be brought, invited into them. Um, masons approach people, they, they don't go out in the street, hey, would you like to join Freemasonry? They pick and choose who they let in. And then, and then so they, they're, they're target family members and they won't let them into the inner group, but they will get them into Freemasonry so they can have an influence and they, some along will come side come alongside them and they can influence their life or to be there for when when that person um, may need somebody and then they can create the circumstances to cause that person to turn to this other person for him to put their arm around and be be a support and get you know manipulate life circumstances so that they can 
craft, you know, craft with like with their little levers and little tongs and their little le you know, little barge poles and they can you know, manipulate your life circumstances. I've seen all the all the patterns in my own life. So I hope that's been um, edifying for somebody and who's listened to this. I'm gonna close now because it's getting really it'll be really long winded. But that's my testimony of how I as a babe, as a Christian babe fell into Mormonism and was, was uh, hooked and drawn into Mormonism and how the Lord freed me and gave me a te wonderful testimony of his loving grace and his understanding of all these dark things and how he's delivered me, delivered me from that evil. So I'm going to close out in the holy precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.